We're getting ready for the kickoff mm -hmm. to <laughs> the yeah. Hidden Origins Tour. Yes. Yeah. Sedona, Arizona. We're doing it. Taking We're drugs, it. taking drugs. <laughs> right? Right? Right. Don't try to call her hardcore. All uh, kinds of uh, secrets tonight. Osolo Kossaman, this is the, the hardest core stuff you can get. <laughs> right there. That's what's up. You gonna have a great show tonight? Yes. Tune in. Woo! Tune in. Woo! Welcome. <laughs> So firstly, thank you very much for coming. It's lovely to see such a nice crowd here. And um, yeah, give yourself a round of applause. It's uh, fantastic being back in Sedona. Haven't been here for, I think, um, three years now, at least two years, three years ago. Um, and nice to be back in the USA. Last year, 2016, we skipped because we were in the elections in South Africa. So it was a big year for us. Nearly killed me. And poor Emma, it was her introduction to South Africa. <laughs> and uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to start this presentation. Firstly, thanks very much to everyone that's helped here. There are a bunch of people that have been working behind the scenes here that I haven't even met and um, only meeting now. So thank you very much to everyone that played a part in spreading the word. This is our first uh, stop on the USA tour. Uh, after this, we go to another 12 cities in the USA and in Canada, and it's lovely to start in, uh, in Sedona. And um, yeah, we're filming this evening, so um, hopefully this will be a video that many people can enjoy online as soon as we've got it edited. And um, to Chuck and Alyssa, Thank you very much for doing this wonderful recording and setting everything up. You're absolute stars. And also to Neil for um, being behind the scenes and helping to organize this entire tour. And um, let's kick off. Uh, I call this the Hidden Origins, Exploring the Nature of Our Reality Tour. Because I'm going to start getting into some very interesting areas that I have not really covered before new research, new information as it keeps growing and expanding. So, but before I get into it, I'd just like to remind you of some of the, which I wasn't able to do uh, at Contact in the Desert, so I'll start doing it uh, as part of the tour. Uh, there's Dean Leprini and myself on the last uh, Sacred Sites tour. This was taken in Bushman's Kloof, that's filled with hundreds if not thousands of Bushman rock art paintings. And we just finished doing a ceremony, a sunrise ceremony, and our faces were filled with beautiful Bushman ochre. Um, and uh, just to remind you that we're doing another Sacred Sites tour from the 19th of September to the 4th of October 2017, because the one in March was such a great success. People loved it so much, we decided we'll do another Equinox tour in September. So if you like this kind of thing, please take note of this and uh, email Dean go to that website and get all the details and email Dean and they do all the bookings and etc. This is just to show you how happy everybody is when they get to Adam's calendar. <laughs> it is a, a truly life-changing experience. I must admit I am getting more and more into it and I can't believe that it's the fourth year that we've actually done this tour now and uh, the sacred sites tour tours around the very important sites in southern Africa that very few people are aware of, exposing that part of our, our human history. So, this is getting out of the matrix of division into resonance and unity. As you know by now, I like to connect the dots from the past to the present and see what we can learn from the ancient past and how we can put the ancient knowledge to the benefit of humanity today. And the question is, why does this matter? So many people say, well, I don't really care what happened in the past, I just care. Well, you know, I think if we don't know who we are and where we come from, how could we possibly know where we are going or at least be on the path, the right path? So I believe that what we learn from the ancient, um, ancient history and the, the murky origins of humankind is a very clear uh, indicator of what we should not be doing because it seems nothing that we've done so far has worked because this is why we're in this mess. So the more we learn about the ancient past, the, the clearer it becomes as to what we shouldn't be doing into the future. And that's how I like to see it. So the, there are five or six points that I like to stress before we start again, or as we start. 
that first of all, everything is connected. If, and this is where our education and information systems really let us down because they compartmentalize everything for us. And, and you know, the, the need to know basis, now everything is hidden in boxes, the whole pyramid structure of our learning and our corporate, corporate corporatized system and, and our lives is completely divided in so many ways. And we forget that everything is connected. Everything on every level is connected. So let's keep reminding ourselves of that and how every, uh, every action that we make, everything we do has, a, has, a, has an effect um, around, not only around us, but throughout the fabric of creation. Every thought we have has an effect on the fabric of creation everywhere. And so through this connectedness is, is, uh, is how we can co-create a beautiful world for ourselves and for our children and for all of humanity. Our history is much older than we can imagine. This is becoming more and more evident. And our history is also much stranger than what we can imagine. And that's, that's been evident for a long time, but that strangeness seems to have been hidden from us. Um, things are not as they seem. And this is where the nature of reality really kicks in. Everything we've been told is a lie. Now, 30 years ago, I had a suspicion that we are being lied to. 20 years ago, I was a lot more confident that we are being lied to about quite a lot of things. Today, I'm pretty much very, very sure that almost everything we've been told by our authorities and our governments is a lie. And it's from that perspective that we need to, to you know, investigate different ways and different routes for, for humanity and everything we do. We know very, very little about what's really going on, the nature of reality, who we are, why are we here. If anyone tells you they've got it all figured out, they're lying to themselves and they're lying to you. Because this stuff is just so weird and I'm sure I'm telling you that things that you already know. Just, just you know, reinforce that in your mind and uh, keep an open mind at all times. We are told that the ancient civilizations are primitive and they look something like this. This is what most historians tell us. And, uh, and it's fascinating that these primitive ancient civilizations, because obviously we are the pinnacle, pinnacle of civilization, we are the smartest we've ever been, this is it. All of human history has led us to this point, we now have industrialization, we have cranes and machines, we can, we can fly airplanes and all this kind of crap, and this is why we believe that we are the most advanced and the pinnacle of humanity. Well, obviously that's not true, but this is how our, our history is depicted to us. The ancients were primitive, and yet, on the one hand, while they show us how primitive they were, they show us what they've left behind. And this is what they left behind. They left behind things like this, and this, and this, and structures that we just marvel at today and wonder how the hell they did this. And they had nothing to do, these guys. They just sat around, you know, in their cave and made a fire and said, hey, shall we just, we got all this time to kill. Why don't we just make some big statues and pile them up and confuse future generations? And hey, if we build a big wall and some of the stones can stick out and look like faces sticking out the wall, that could be cool. Or let's dig a big hole in the ground and surrounded by big stones, that'll be cool. Um, or they didn't have an alphabet, they didn't have a written language, and somebody made a, a, no, a noise and it was like a ha. Ah. And they said, hey, we've got one letter, let's just carve the letter out into hundreds of stones, and like we've got nothing better to do. And then, hey, hey maybe if we pile up a bunch of stones and it'll, it'll look like it's reaching up to the skies, this'll be cool, let's do this, let's build that. And, uh, or, hey, there's a rock face, let's take some hammers and chisels. Oh, we don't have chisels and hammers yet, we only got stones. Okay, let's take other stones and carve a whole city out of the rock face um, because that'll be a cool thing to do. And, uh, and then, hey, hey, some pillars, let's make pillars, that could be cool. Uh, and this is what they did. They just had so much time to kill because they didn't have anything to do. They didn't have jobs and they didn't have to go to work. They could do what they wanted. And uh, then stuff got covered by water and, and we discovering all their... They doodling <laughs> out of rock and then they made beautiful statues out of rock that they hid in the jungles that we're discovering and, and these strange pyramids and more big statues and uh, elongated heads and all kinds of stuff and, 
And then they took solid rocks and they carved them out and they made holes into solid rocks because they, they thought that could be a really cool thing to do. And, and, uh, and then they covered them and then they played with them and they made sounds with them. And, uh, and piled giant blocks on top of each other. And then, and then this one here, Borobudur, that's a really spectacular one. That was a real, they were really, really bored when they made this one. And the top of Borobudur is quite spectacular. What's most important about all these ancient sites and these primitive people in the ancient times is they did all of this, apparently, according to our historians, they did all this with ropes, pulleys, hammers and chisels. <clears throat> well, clearly, you all know that this is not the case. But the fascinating thing about this is that most of the stuff that I've just shared with you is either in the Northern Hemisphere or gathered around, clustered around the equator. This is the fascinating thing. Very little seems to have happened in the southern hemisphere over the millennia and thousands of years of civilizations on our planet. Very little ever surfaces in the southern hemisphere. Why is that the case? And yet, if the southern Africa seems to be the cradle of humankind, and we read this in all kinds of surveys, how come we can't find any evidence of ancient civilizations in this kind of spectacular activity that I've just shared with you? How can we never see that emerge in, southern, in the Southern Hemisphere? And yet, this is why the discovery of the stone ruins in Southern Africa is so critical and so important. Because suddenly it brings the Southern Hemisphere and Southern Africa into the limelight and into the focal point of serious activity that we did not know about. So, discovering the vanished civilizations in Southern Africa is really balancing the Northern and Southern Hemisphere activities of ancient civilizations. What we have, what we know, is that these vanished civilizations of Southern Africa left behind more than 10 million stone, circular stone ruins. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I've done it over and over again. So, there are more than 10 million of these circular stone structures left behind. Welcome to my world of the stone circles in Adam's calendar. And they are quite spectacular. Most of them you can't see from the ground. You only see them from aerial photographs. Everyone is completely unique. All of them are circular. None of them are the same. And these stone circles cover most of South Africa, or large parts of South Africa, very extreme areas of Zimbabwe, parts of Botswana and Mozambique. Sometimes they are beautiful flower shapes like this. And, um, and each and every one is completely unique. This is what the walls look like from the ground. They're not very high. Some of them have been reused in more recent times and reconstructed and made higher. What you're looking at is the largest cluster of stone ruins found anywhere in the world until today. Until we find something else, these stone circles of Southern Africa are the largest cluster of ancient ruins anywhere on Earth today. As I said, there are more than 10 million of these stone circles. What's even more interesting is that these, they're connected by these weird channels. They look like these wires that connect them together. And also notice that weird kind of spider's web effect that goes away from the circle. No stone circle stands alone, even though it might look on, on photographs that the stone circle is on its own. If you look carefully, you'll see the, the hidden spider's web effect or the channels that connected them to the other stone circles. You'll see those hidden behind, beneath the soil around the circle. <clears throat> there you can see the channel at the top connecting the stone circles. You can see the extreme age and the erosion of these structures. Uh, obviously, much destruction has been done by, by um, um, town planning, town development, farming, roadworks, and that's really mostly where the destruction happens. There are huge parts of, of South Africa where you, if you fly over in a helicopter or with a drone these days at, at sunrise or sunset, the vast areas that you can actually see many of these structures hidden under the soil. 
but when the sun is at a very low angle, you, it shows it up beautifully. You realize that there are vast areas that are just simply covered by these stone structures, but we can't see them. They don't even stick out of the soil anymore. And these channels, you can see channels that run, cover entire mountains with these stone structures all connected to each other. And there's another great example of a channel running over there into some weird hexagonal ruins and structures, cluster of hexagonal cells. This is all very, not far from my house, actually. Um, when we sit on the balcony at Stone Circle or at the Ubuntu office, that's what you look at. The mountains around us are covered in all these structures. That's why we are located there. And the, the other mystery is the, the vast number of, of agricultural terraces, 450,000 square kilometers and more of agricultural terraces. Keep in mind that the, all, the, all the history books tell us that Southern Africa was a sparsely populated part of the world. Apparently nobody lived there. Many, you know, until about you know, a thousand years ago when the Bantu tribes eventually made it down to where they live today. Up to that time, nobody lived there. There were some, you know, the, some bushmen, hunter-gatherers that used to roam around, but that was it. Well, the 450,000 square kilometers of agricultural terraces clearly tell us a different story. So, who built those terraces, when they were built, when were they built, and what were they used for? Were they growing food? Were they doing something else? And how many people were they feeding? And what happened to all, the, all those people that they were feeding? These terraces cover entire mountains. Uh, when you start seeing them, you suddenly see them everywhere. And um, the Google, Google Earth images give you a very interesting um, idea of how widely spread they are as well. Again, South Africa, Zimbabwe, there are parts of Zimbabwe that it's almost impossible not to see these, these terraces. It's unbelievable. Again, this is not far from my house. This is the entire side of the mountain is just covered in these and it goes on until you eventually hit either forestry or some farms that have developed farming or so forth and then it obviously disappears. And the other key thing is that there are no doors and entrances to these stone structures. And that obviously immediately excludes dwellings for people or dwellings for animals. So whenever you read in, in the you know, very, very naive history books that tell us that these are dwellings for migrating tribes or for their animals, uh, this is clearly a very ill-researched re author that put that down. This has got nothing to do for dwellings for animals or people. Archaeological drawings all the way from 1939 show us some of these clusters, stone, these stone circles with no doors and entrances, and you can see how they clustered together. In many areas you can see some of these clusters, and often they're actually carved on rocks. So sometimes you see these carved on stones when you walk among the stone ruins. Uh, that's even the, the that's truly boggled my mind. It's like, what came first? You know, that they first carved the stuff out and then they lay it out, or they first lay it out, and somebody came and carved it on a rock as a, as a, a sort of latecomer architect or, or town planner or somebody trying to document what they discovered there on a rock. Uh, it's just spectacular. And sometimes these, uh, these stone circles are concentric circles with no doors and entrances. And then you start realizing that this is, there's a lot more to this that meets the eye. And there's, obviously they were used for some very specific purpose. The flagship, obviously, uh, as you may know by now, is none other than Adam's calendar. Uh, well, that name, just so that you know where the name comes from, when I first met Johann Heine in uh, 2000, uh, early 2007, Johann Heine was the guy that rediscovered the site. And there he is, uh, also with his incredible discovery, realizing that it's a working and functioning calendar where the shadow of this, of this rock here the setting sun casts a shadow on that rock there, and the shadow moves from this side across to that side. On this side is the summer solstice, and then you can tell every day of the year by the setting, the shadow of the setting sun, until you get to the winter solstice on this side, and it starts to move back. So it's still an accurate working calendar, and as far as I know, it's the oldest working calendar, sun calendar of, it, of this nature in the world. And, uh, but that was just the built-in feature for the calendar. That's not by far, or far removed from the main reason why this site is actually there. 
So when I first found it and I was writing a book about it, I had to come up with a title for it. And you know, we were all speculating it was very close to the origins of humankind. So who was the first person alive? It was Adam, obviously. We all know it was Adam. <laughs> so that's why it's called Adam's Calendar. And somehow the name stuck. <laughs> so that's what it is. And uh, Baba Kreda Mutwa told me, uh, I just released the book. You can see it lying on the table there. And when I showed him this book, he literally, he literally burst into tears, started crying. He said he never thought he would see that special place again. And then he told me a lot of information about the place. The fact that he was initiated there in 1937, that it's known as Inzalo Yelanga, or birthplace of the sun, where humanity was created by the gods to be slaves in the gold mines. It's really that simple. You know, there's no mixing of the words here. It's very, very clear what the African shamans, what knowledge and information they have held for a long, long time. And you can see the Eurocentric influence and the desperate uh, attempts to destroy that knowledge and information by the Eurocentric history books that have replaced all the ancient knowledge, not only in Southern Africa, but in all the native lands around the world when they were invaded some 500 years ago by the, those thugs from Europe. When they invaded the Americas, Africa, Asia, Australia, they did the same, they, they followed the exactly same plan of action. They invade, they take over the land, they, they kill all the knowledge keepers, they destroy all their written material or any kind of artifacts that they have that that, that contain information from ancient times and that's how they create a species with amnesia where you separate people from their ancestors so you create a gap and a generational gap separate the people from their ancestors replace all their books and knowledge with Eurocentric history books and the Bible and the Quran and suddenly you've got a, a species with amnesia they have no idea who they are, where they come from and why we're here and then we look at the, some of the remaining knowledge keepers that have somehow escaped the, the, the massacre when they come out with all the knowledge and information, we look at them like they've gone crazy because our history books don't have this information in it. What are you talking about? You know, our historians would have written it down. They know all the stuff. So Adam's Calendar is a spectacular place right on the edge of a cliff, as you can see over there. Badly destroyed, but in an attempt to resurrect it, that's what it looks like. We have um, the stone man closest to you. We have a Horus bird that looks out at the three stones of Orion. And in the distance we have two pyramids. There's actually a third one that align with the rise of Orion. So we have Horus, Orion and the pyramids that line up. And guess what? Not only does the same kind of uh, imagery and, and uh, information that we find all over Egypt is encoded in the site, but the site itself is aligned on the 31 degrees east longitudinal line. There's Adam's calendar or Adam's pyramids, Great Zimbabwe. If you extend the line, you get to Great Pyramid of Giza. It's all aligned beautifully along 31 degrees east. And uh, that tells us that whatever is going on here, it was a very, very important longitudinal positioning for those ancients that put all these structures together. Those guys and their loincloths and their hammers and stone hammers and chisels. These, they were really busy. They were up and down that line. They didn't stop. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so what is all this activity about in Southern Africa? And it's always about one thing. It's always about the gold. And that's the, the spectacular thing. You know, we forget, often forget that the Egyptian empire was all about the gold as well. You know, the Egyptians had so much gold, they were putting it on the pyramids, they were, everything was made from bloody gold. Remember, even when the, when the Israelites were leaving, uh, when the Hebrews were leaving Egypt, if that event ever happened, because you know that there's no real evidence that that actually is a historic event, you know, now whew, there's another whole page we can open about the lies and deceptions, right? So it, remember that they were told by God to go and raid the Egyptians' homes and steal all the gold, take all their gold because you're going to need it when we get to the desert. So it's all about the gold. The Egyptian empire is all about the gold and we forget about that. Um, I was astounded when, when we got um, into this desert town and I forget wh where it was, what the town was called, where they discovered hundreds of golden mummies made of solid gold in Egypt. And I forget what the name of the town is. It's just, and you start realizing, oh, it's all about the gold. 
And Southern Africa especially is all about the gold. In the late 1400s, when the Portuguese first came around the Cape of Good Hope on their way to India, they, they met a lot of native tribes from the Mozambican side, and they, they also found a lot of uh, ancient stone ruins. This is Great Zimbabwe, by the way, from a side view of Great Zimbabwe. And uh, when they asked the, 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 the locals, what, you know, whose land is this, they were given a very unusual bit of information. They said it was known as, it was called the Terra dos Makomates, or the land of the Makomati people. And the Makomati people were Dravidian gold miners from southern India. Gold miners and gold merchants. They were already there in southern Africa. Seemingly before these other tribes, African tribes, came and settled there, that land was already occupied by the Dravidians mining and trading with gold, with the East. And now this is definitely not information you're going to find in any Eurocentric history book. right? But the, the gold mining goes back much further in time. Um, 700 AD, there's some spectacular information in the museum in Zanzibar, how the gold trade was already very, very strong between Zanzibar and Southern Africa, and specifically the port of Sofala, which is in Mozambique, um, which is near the town of Baira in Mozambique today. And the, then we meet uh, in the 11th century, Ahmed al Biruni describes the prosperous gold exports from the port of Sofala. There you can see it over there, Sofala. This is a 16th century Portuguese map um, that shows all that. And it describes that the gold was a, a month's journey inland from the port of Sofala. And this is a map again, the 16th century Portuguese map of the port of Sofala. It was a busy, busy place. Um, and uh, a well-known place where gold was exported to the rest of the world. And what happens if you go one month inland from Sofala? There you go, there's Baira, it's today's Baira in Mozambique. And if you go one month, one month journey inland, you get to about there. And that's Masvingo in Zimbabwe. And what is it, Masvingo, Zimbabwe? The great Zimbabwe ruins. And we meet the great Monomotapa kingdom, the, the golden kings that were never defeated. The house of stone, Zimbabwe. And we meet the Monomotapa kingdom, and it seems that those are the guys that were responsible for all the gold that was being exported for a long, long time. And it's most likely that that's where King Solomon got all his gold. And the, the, the whole story of Sheba and all the gold somehow can be related to them. Is there any evidence of ancient gold mines that produced all this gold in Southern Africa? Of course there is. Because wherever there are stone circles, there are gold mines. And uh, there was a geological survey done in uh, between 2005 and 2010 and I was given this information by a geologist in the town of Nelspreit uh, when I was doing a workshop there and he said he was part of the survey and uh, Anglo-American performed a survey and they found that there were 75,000 of these kind of gold mines found into the side of the sides of mountains scattered all over that area and uh, that just tells us that this is not something that was uh, you know a low-level mining activity. The, the reason why these mines are still there because they're up against the, the sides of the mountains. So they probably didn't get covered by the flood that covered and destroyed much of the rest of the, the, um, the activity and the stone circles and so forth. And uh, I just jumped to a whole other train of thought because I realized I haven't covered that part. Uh, so the, the reason that uh, the stone circles are covered by soil and sand is because it probably was destroyed by the flood some 10 or 12,000 years ago. That's why everything is covered by sand and soil. There's sea sand sediment everywhere. We found seashells and fossilized fish in the stone circles on tops of mountains. So there's, there's loads of evidence that there must have been a large volume of, of water that came through there and seawater that probably destroyed that entire civilization. So. In the town of Leidenberg, which is also famous for these, for these very strange and unusual um, heads, they're known as the Leidenberg heads, that are very out of place in that part of the world, <clears throat> I must tell you. And uh, 
in the town of Leidenburg, around that area, is that's where they've uh, they counted up to 75,000 of these ancient mines. But there are many more mysterious mines that have been found all over South Africa, in the northern parts of South Africa as well. Mysterious ancient tunnels found in the 30s filled with tools and artifacts. Uh, the Volkberg mountain uh, on very close to Zimbabwe. I was told by an archaeologist and a geologist from Witts University that he walked through miles and miles of underground tunnels, ancient mines. And the, the mystery there was that they, were, they seemed to have extracted all the gold, but they left all the platinum slag behind. They weren't interested in the platinum, they were interested in the gold only. Then in the 1990s, I was told by a researcher here in the USA that he, he was given information that De Beers found De Beers, which is now owned by Anglo-American and the Oppenheimer family, as you, <clears throat> as you may know. The, 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 that's all Oppenheimer, the South African leg of the Oppenheimer family. Um, they found a mine 22,000 feet deep that was cut with absolute precision with technology that they do not possess. And if, if Anglo-American or De Beers does not possess that technology, then I can tell you no one else possesses that technology because they have the leading edge of all technology. So, um, and then also I was told by the chief geologist by Anglo, from Anglo, um, over a beer at a pub, uh, that um, they find many ancient mines. They find old mines all the time. Mine shafts, uh, mine tunnels, and then I asked him, so what do you do with them? And he said, well, our instructions are, if we ever come across that, is to cover it up and move right on. And uh, at that time, when I asked him at that time, he said, oh, we just recently found an ancient shaft in Bloemfontein, the capital of the Orange Free State in South Africa. And he said it was about 500 feet, 500 meters deep, and there were some skeletal remains at the bottom of this ancient mine. And I freaked out. I said, wow, so what's going on? Are you going to, you know... You know, explore the or, or research the skeletal remains. He said, "Oh no, we covered it up. We it's all covered up, and we moved right along." So you can just imagine the amount of destruction that the mining operations have have have, have been responsible for. But in December 2014, I was um, privy to a new. This is a modern mine in South Africa, and. Um, in one of these mines, the side of it caved in completely that exposed a, an ancient tunnel that was running just below it. So all these miners went into this old tun the ancient tunnel and they started finding some really bizarre stuff. But the tunnel was far more, what, far more uh, smoother and far more, you know, you, obviously tools used that were far more advanced than the tools they were using to dig, dig their tunnels. So within, within hours, that entire tunnel was shut down, that, that arm of the, that part of the mine was shut down, no one was ever allowed in there again, and it was never reopened. So instead of exploring it and sharing that and, and, uh, and you know, uh, turning it into an interesting archaeological exploration, uh, it gets shut down, never spoken about. In fact, that just reminds me, <clears throat> now I'll talk about that later. Um, in, in Zimbabwe, Nyanga, the northeast province of Zimbabwe, uh, very ancient ruins, very, very ancient ruins that you know, hardly, you can just find little scattered evidence of it. And we find water furrows and slave pits, water furrows that are carved out of solid rock that run for, for hundreds and hundreds of meters all over the place and connect to stone circles and are also connected to these so-called slave pits. And, uh, and this is what our archaeologists tell us, that these are slave pits for either slaves, animals, or grain. And then uh, that, because that's all it can be, right? You know, animals, slaves, or grain. So you can think, really? So you're going to put the animals in there, and then how do you get them out? Are you, you going to throw them in there? And, and grain? You're going to put grain in there? That's not a very smart thing to do, right? Uh, the first bit of rain, and what are you going to have? Beer? Or from all your grain? What are you, what are you doing here? And slaves, now that's a, that's a good one, because can you imagine? No slaves ever going to escape from that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just such nonsensical garbage that they come up with. And, and the fascinating thing is that the, one of the um, lecturers at Zimbabwe University, Anne Kritzinger, who's a geologist, wrote some phenomenal papers on her research about these so-called slave pits. And she shows that these were actually 
purification or extraction tanks for the purification of gold. She found inlet valves and outlet valves and in the outlet valves she found up to two grams of ton, two grams per ton of gold sediment in the outlet valves. So it must have been involved in some sort of gold process. She sent me lots of papers when she discovered I speak about her in my presentations. She sent me all the latest papers which actually show more spectacular evidence of her research. But the other interesting thing about this vanished civilization of Southern Africa are the, the connections to many, many so-called northern civilizations like the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Romans, Phoenicians, the Maltese, the Hindus, the Dravidians, the Dogon people of Mali, and specifically my favorite are the Inca or the pre-Inca empire, which and you can obviously all of these are all obsessed with gold, right? They're all golden empires. And the pre-Inca civilization was found in, accidentally in a sinkhole in a town called Carltonville, which is also a big mining area. I grew up on the, known as the West Strand, west, west of Johannesburg, which is just filled with gold mines. There must be 60 gold mines there, and every year more gold mines open up. You know, our poor country is being mined into oblivion. It's insane. It's just, a, it's just to become a mining colony for the elite. And, um, and in Carltonville, uh, was known for its sinkholes, these holes that just appear out of nowhere. And uh, around 1975, a bunch of uh, um, mine rescue team went to one of these to test their equipment, and at the bottom of it, they found one of the sides was caved in. They opened it up, cleared it out, and found this tunnel that, was, that went into the darkness. And the tunnel was described to me to be paved all the way around underneath and paved all the way around, something like this. This is not the tunnel, but it's... I found, so you can just imagine it, it wasn't, when they found it, it wouldn't have been beautifully backlit for a photo opportunity. So he says, when they found it, they walked in there and they were, and, and they were obviously very nervous, because this is like, what, what the hell is this doing here? And, um, <clears throat> and several meters into the darkness, they stumbled upon one of these, facing them in the dark. And he said, the, this man told me that, that uh, they got such a fright, they just turned around and got out of there as quickly as they could. And they never ever told anyone about this until he told me about this, and then three months later he died. So I'm glad that I listened to the old man. The fascinating thing about the, these, these um, ancient mines in South Africa, that we also have a connection to Egyptian gold mines specifically with the, the birds. Theodore Bent was an archaeologist, British archaeologist that traveled pretty much, he was a well-traveled guy in Egypt, all over Africa, and spent uh, several years in southern Africa, and he explored Great Zimbabwe. He's actually one of the guys that left us the best clues and evidence from his excavation in Great Zimbabwe. He talks about several meters of sediment that indicate gold mining civilizations. That's from his exploration in Great Zimbabwe. And uh, what he made a connection with, which is fascinating, are the, the birds on a pedestal in Egypt to the, the birds on a pedestal at Great Zimbabwe. Now, the birds on a pedestal in Egypt were also used as mascots or, or protector mascots, um, or guardians of the gold miners in the mines of Egypt that he excavated. He says that the carvings of the birds on, on a pedestal like this were found at the entrances to the gold mines in Egypt for protection of the gold miners. And that's what the really interesting connection is. The Zimbabwean birds, the birds on a pedestal, that I believe are much older, and uh, I believe would have then been also the guardians of the ancient gold miners, or the first gold miners on earth, quite probably, in southern Africa. And I found what I believe are even older versions of that, these very basic rep, uh, stones that are the broad base and the narrow head, that I believe are the very, very early basic prototypes of these birds on a pedestal, or these birds, that we then see more refined as time goes by. The Sumerian references to gold mining are quite spectacular, because the, we, we find so much information about Southern Africa in the Sumerian texts, about the Anunnaki, what they were doing, but what I find, tell you, what I find even more spectacular is, is the most recent discovery that I made literally a week ago is what, what I couldn't understand, what, what puzzled me is like, where did these Sumerians, because this is the oldest deciphered language that we know, right? 
and uh, there are others, but we, there's not enough information about some of these ancient languages. But this is by far the, the most understood at this stage, and a lot of information is coming about the cuneiform text, this cuneiform kind of text. And I found out that the cuneiform text is actually encoded with light energy. Where did they choose these symbols from? How did they come up with these silly little, you know, where does this originate from? And then I stumbled upon the work of Michael Evans. This incredible work that shows how light manifests itself. If you turn, uh, if you create like a buckyball, Buckminster Fuller ball, and, um, and, and, you've, and uh, out of these uh, light rods, what happens at the junctions of these light rods? How light carries information and how it manifests. And this is what it looks like. It looks like this. Can you see what I mean? The exact shapes that are used in the cuneiform texts. So I'm beginning to think that the cuneiform texts are actually encoded with, remember, light is information, light carries information. And each one of these light structures, or structures that's filled with light, will carry information. And I'm thinking now that this is what inspired the Sumerians and those guys that came up with that cuneiform text, is to use these, this essence of how light manifests itself in sacred geometry, in the edges of sacred geometric patterns. So when we read cuneiform text, we're actually reading text that's encoded with the information that carries the light. This is a whole new spin on what we may be getting or what we may be missing in the cuneiform texts. So, uh, I, you know, this is the first time I've ever spoken about this. So, this is a whole new level of information that we need to go and look at. But uh, these, uh, these cuneiform texts give us a lot of information about the Anunnaki, and I think that's like the second tier information. Once we get back to, to this, and really studying this, and how it's laid out on the clay tablets, we might find a whole another 3D imprint of information that it carries. Um, so we learn about the Anunnaki, the Anunna gods, obviously, Anu, Enlil, and Enki, and they work in the Abzu. And the Abzu has been given many meanings, but the primary meaning that I was attracted to is where, it's, this is where the gold came from, and they refer to the gold all the time. And uh, this is some of the, some of the translations. Um, <clears throat> Great rivers there rapidly flowed, and abode by the flowing waters, Enki for himself established, he established a fortress for his house and other places where the workers would live and where the bowels of the earth to enter. Place of deepness he determined for the heroes into the earth's bowels to descend to extract the gold. And I often thought that maybe Great Zimbabwe was like the mine manager's house. You know, I spoke about this before because the mining towns that I grew up on, it was always very easy to find the mine manager's house. Just like stand around in the town and look around and find the biggest house on the, on the hill. And that's always where the mine manager used to live. And Great Zimbabwe is exactly that. I mean, it's the house on the hill, the biggest house on the hill in that whole area. And I thought, well, maybe that's where Enki used to hang out or there was his house. But... I don't know, I'll tell you why, because when you look at Great Zimbabwe, that big conical tower inside doesn't really, I think that the, the whole structure of Great Zimbabwe is very similar to the same, um, the, the way that the, the other stone circles were laid out, and we'll, you'll find out what that is all about a bit later, if you don't know that yet. So, in the Abzu, Enki plans was conceiving where to build his house, where for heroes, dwellings to prepare, where the bowels of the earth to enter. And now we read about his, his um, technology and so forth. The earth splitter, Enki there established, there within the earth a gash to make, by way of tunnels, earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. But to do all this mine work and to get all the gold, they needed some serious help because they couldn't get enough gold. You should know this by now. And this is where they decide to create a little slave. And this is where we enter the picture as humans. This is, however, a very, very murky area. You know, I'm really simplifying it here, and I'm sure that you are deeply aware of how murky and mysterious the origins of human race is and what the potential genetic contributors are or may be to our, to our gene pool. And this is a huge discussion, but it, it does remain 
very, there's a, definitely a key line here that suggests that we were created originally as slaves by the Anunnaki to dig in the gold mines. And this is what many of the ancient cultures believe, especially the African cultures believe this unquestionably. Um, so, sorry, I missed that. Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over. Let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki carry on his back. And then a primitive worker shall be created. Our command will he understand. Our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki in the Abzu relief shall come. Just notice here, I'm going to come to this later. This is apparently a, a scene depicting the creation of Adam or Adamu. And, uh, and this dude here is holding something in his hand. At first I thought it was a flask or something, right? Or with some mixture. But actually it looks like a cone-shaped tool more than anything else. I'm going to come to cone-shaped tools a little bit later. Because with the cone-shaped tools, they pretty much did everything. And then the mysterious stone tools and artifacts. I was so happy when I found this one. See, You can see how happy I was there. <laughs> and uh, uh, Cone-shaped tools that just... I, I can't believe they were completely ignored. It's just like... It's, you know, it's like they're so obvious. Now, now that you know that, that they, they, they are possibly the most critical ancient tool that's ever been used by ancient civilizations and it's like looking at the trees and not seeing a forest it's like they're everywhere but we didn't see them until i started picking it up so these cone-shaped tools are just bloody everywhere and um, and then together with the donut shaped stones or the torus torus stones there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these donut shaped stones or torus stones or as our very clever archaeologists call them weights for digging sticks um, because that's what the ancient people did. They have nothing better to do. As you know, they built huge monuments and these things, pillars and giant statues and things. So to make a little donut shaped stone with other stones, because they remember they didn't have any metal at that stage. It was done by stones, people in the Stone Age. So you know, they just made them because they were bored. What I find fascinating is that, um, that these ancient, the, in some past life regressions, the Anunnaki overlords or the, the, the guys that were overseeing the building of the stone circles, they were apparently a lot larger than the, the, the humans, had these donut shaped stones or these sacred stones hanging around their neck. They actually had them as tools around their neck and they would use them as tools. And you'll see mo most likely what they would have been used for. There are hundreds of thousands of these donut shaped stones and, um, and uh, I have a number of them in the museum. And, uh, and then the stones that ring like bells. And, and that was the big discovery. When I discovered that the stones in the stone circles and the tools and artifacts actually have very strong acoustic properties, I realized that we're dealing with sound and resonance here. And um, just to show you briefly how the stones that ring like bells, you can also go watch this on the internet. Let me also just show you how some of these other stones ring like bells. Um, this is what I call, and when, as you can see, we find many, many of these elongated stones. This one is full of patina. It's thick patina, so it's quite dull, but you can still hear the effect. And this is a, a beautiful one. This one actually rings at two different frequencies. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. They, they're quite large. Look at this. Look at this one. And it looks also like it was inserted into something up to that point. And also, remember, they all ring like bells. This, this one is no exception. Alright, on that note. There we go. That's better. That's what you want. You realize that this thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. Notice it's the same pitch, right? 
and that's not by accident. So, but the ruins were not dwellings for people or animals, so what were these ruins for? This is a big question. What, why did they build more than 10 million of these structures? What were they doing with all of this? And to get the answers for that, we have to look at creation itself. We have to grapple with a deeper understanding of creation and where things seem to come from. And that's to do with sound and resonance, the source of all creation. But the moment we come up with that statement or we enter that um, domain, we realize and start to face the horrible truth that everything we've been told is a lie. And like I said earlier, today I'm no longer surprised and I truly believe that every facet of our reality has been affected, manipulated, infiltrated and poisoned with half-truths. It's not always completely a lie. But the best way to tell a lie is you keep a little bit of the truth and then you're surrounded by a lot of falsifications. And what people tend to do, what we do, because we're bleeding hearts, right? By nature, we want to be good. We want to share and create and help each other. So we always look for the good in everything. So we find the truth in the lie and then we believe that, well, if there's a little bit of truth in there, then the rest must also be true. And that's so we actually become our own worst enemies. And this is how they can pull the wool over our eyes all the time, time and time again, over and over again. So we got to step out of that kind of naive position and start realizing that this is something has been going on, not just the last few decades, but our governments and our corporations and the banks and those that pretty much run the world. But it's been going on for centuries and it's been going on for millennia. The lies and the deceptions have been going on for thousands and thousands of years, not just the last few decades, because now suddenly we've woken up and we realize we've been lied to, so we think, oh, it must have just happened recently. No, it's been going on for bloody ever. That's the problem. So how do we now start to you know, distinguish the lies from the truth? And I'm beginning to think that many of the ancient texts could have actually been manipulated and been written in ancient times with the intention of finding, you know, in some future timeline, and the dumb schmucks that find it will go, oh, wow, this is ancient stuff, it was written, it must be true, it was hidden in the cave somewhere, so it must all be true. So, you know, that's how you can also create deception down the line. But, okay, let's write all this crap down here, we'll bury it in a vault somewhere, and they'll find it at such and such a time. Or they'll guide us to finding it and discovering it. And say, oh, wow, we discovered Nahamadi texts, and all this, and, and so we all believe it's all true. So this is, we've got to be really careful as what, to, what we actually believe and what, what has been set up for us to keep deceiving us. So I no longer bloody believe anything. I tell you, it's like, that's not true. I believe, you know, I believe the children are a future. <laughs> but <laughs> there are some things I believe. <laughs> and what, I'll tell you what, what, what strikes me is that the bigger the lie, the more inclined we are to believe it. Because we can't imagine that somebody would be able or have the capacity to create such a humongous lie and plan it for so long that it's just beyond our level of comprehension. Because we just we can't do it. So everything in, in history, science, technology, health, biology, genetics, the universe around us, Religion and money, obviously, but I mean, yeah, when I look up at the moon, what am I actually looking at? What, what is that thing up there? What the hell is it? I don't know what it is anymore. I don't know. Have you seen the, the, this one camera photographer guy? He's fantastic. He calls himself Crow 777 or something. He's been filming the moon for four years. And he shows clearly that the moon, every now and then, has this like glitch. Like when you watch old computers, remember old TV screens and computers, when you get this little line that went up over your, uh, across your, your computer or across your TV screen? That's what happens on the moon, every so often. This is like the glitch that goes over the surface of the moon. So like, what? And what am I actually looking at when I look up at the moon? So, you know, just... Step, step away from what you think is real and, and what you believe to be the truth and just, just analyze everything with a, from a slightly different perspective. And I want to show you an example that 
basically shows me that if they could if they could lie about this they can lie about everything if they could pull this one off they can pull off anything and this is, this is to do with the Bible. This is Miho Ledworth, my good friend that lives up in Rainier, Washington. He was the advisor to the popes at the Vatican for 17 years. He is a walking encyclopedia. He's one of the most incredible human beings you can ever meet. You can discuss anything with him and he'll launch into a deep level of comprehension of any subject. Historical, Hebrew texts, cuneiform texts, Sumerians, ancient scriptures from the east, from the west, from everywhere. He knows bloody everything, this guy. Right, And um, <clears throat> what he found out is that the opening phrase of the Bible was, was messed with, completely messed with. We all believe and we read the opening text of the Bible that says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, he found out when he was still a student, I believe, that the original Hebrew text was messed with. And that to do that is very difficult because you should know by now that the Hebrew texts and the, the scholars that write that, it's all a mathematical formula. So there's, you know, you, it's very difficult to cheat. It, it has to have so many letters across and phrases and they cross-reference it. So you can figure out very quickly if somebody missed with one of these phrases and these paragraphs. And yet they pull this off. This is what boggles my mind. How could they have pulled this off to lie about it? And he shows that the original Hebrew text... Uh, begins with the letter B, Beth. The, at the moment, the, the Bible starts that says, Ba Rashid, Ba Ba Elohim et Ha Shamayim wa et Ha Ba, it starts with Ba. The second letter of the alphabet. It's not possible because all, all Hebrew sacred texts must begin with the first letter of the alphabet, which is A or Aleph. So somebody messed that up. It's not possible. When he added Aleph, so, so at the moment, it doesn't make any grammatical sense, actually. It's a non-grammatical, incorrect sentence, grammatically incorrect sentence. For any Hebrew-speaking people here, you'll know what I mean. And, and it refers to Elohim here as the gods, but it doesn't make any sense. So when he added A or Aleph, suddenly it says, Abba Rashid bara Elohim et ha shamayim wa et ha which means the father of the beginnings created the heavens created the Elohim, the heavens and the earth. The father of the beginnings created the Elohim, the heavens and the earth. And suddenly the Elohim no longer is God or the plural of gods as we perceive it from the incorrect first statement of the Bible. Now if they could pull that off and lie to us about that, they can bloody pull off anything. So this is how I see these, this deception that we face on every level. Uh, there are three holy cows of our education system that I love to talk about. And these three holy cows that many people find untouchable are that we evolved out of apes, humans evolved out of apes, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, and energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be converted from one form to another. Now, if you mention these in any kind of scientific debate with professors and very clever people from universities, they'll all sit and nod and argue, yes, absolutely, that's how this all bullshit. Absolute lies. The theory of evolution remains a theory of evolution. There is no scientific evidence ever shown that we evolved out of apes. It's all bogus crap that was put into our history books to remove us from a creator or any kind of creation process or the possibility of being created by other ETs or any such activity. So the, the, the theory of evolution is all part of the long line of lies and misinformation and, and deception that goes back thousands of years. It's not something that started recently, right? The fact that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light was, was shattered already in 2005, but many ways has been shattered already, even when, you know, when, when Paul Dirac won his Nobel Prize in 1933. Actually, part of the Nobel Prize or his quantum theory that he, that he won the prize for shows that subatomic particles move faster than the speed of light. But that was never brought up while, while he was receiving his Nobel Prize. So all these, like, it's just like such nonsensical crap and we, uh, we all buy it because we believe these people at university are very clever. So at 2005, at the Middle Tennessee State University, Two undergraduates and, 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 uh, and three high school students, I believe, propelled sound faster than the speed of light. And this is very quickly written up in the American Institute of Physics in 2007 and then hidden from sight. And again, this is what they do all the time. They publish it so they can use it as a trump card later. Oh, well, we knew about this all along. Look, we published it in 2005 or 2007. 
Um, and, and they hide it because they don't want people to know that you can propel sound faster than the speed of light. Of course you can. Why? Because sound is the source of all things. Sound is the creative source of everything, including light. And nothing, sorry, uh, we, and, and the, 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 the best one is that we cannot create or destroy energy. Energy can just be converted from one to another. And then the next breath, they tell us that we all come from the Big Bang. There was nothing, and then suddenly everything is here. So, hold on, so I thought you can't create energy. So what happened here? Oh, no, 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 no. But the energy was already there. It was just in a very, very, very tiny infinitesimal point called the singularity. So it was always there. That's how they get away with the crap that you can't create or, or, or destroy energy. So I, I believe that this is all part of the agenda to keep us dumbed down and manipulated. If you look at the photographs from NASA, if you can believe them, of these spectacular pictures of nebulae and uh, these nebulae, the horse nebulae and the eagle nebulae and all this nebulae and the eye nebulae and all this, and they tell us that there are trillions of stars being born every second. Say, okay, wow, but I thought we can't create energy. So surely it takes energy to, to, for stars to be born. Where is that energy coming from? Where is it going? Oh, from the vac vacuum. Oh, but space is a vacuum, so in a vacuum nothing can exist. So that, that busts EMC square, right? So energy is equal mass times speed of light square. Energy, mass, in a vacuum there's no mass. So if the, vacuum is the, if the mass of vacuum is zero, it means zero times the speed of light is zero. That means there's zero energy in space. So how can anything be created out of... What's going on here? They're just lying to us. Every step of the way, we're being fooled and lied to. <laughs> Spectacular. Another great secret that they've been keeping from us is... Cheers. Thank you. Is, am I sounding hoarse? <laughs> Another great secret that they've been keeping, keeping from us is that water seems to be everywhere in the universe. So there's, there's a vacuum, there's nothing in space, and then all these nebulae are creating stars all the time, and worlds are being formed, but there's nothing, it's a vacuum, so I don't quite understand how that works. You know, where does a vacuum end, and where does a nebula begin, and what is at the boundary at the edge, how does that work? And... Um, you know, vacuum is a very powerful thing. You should know that by now. I mean, a vacuum sucks, right? <laughs> like, have you seen, go on YouTube and see some of the wonderful, uh, you know, videos show you, that show like, you know, how, how vacuum, what happens in a vacuum. It's like, you can't do anything in a vacuum. You can't propel craft in a vacuum. You know, bzz, bzz, all this, the nice, the pictures of gravity and all that. It's like, you can't do that. You can't do that in a vacuum. It doesn't happen. Not going to happen. You can't burn anything. Nothing can move. There's nothing. Zero energy. According to EMC square, there's zero energy. You can't do anything in a vacuum. And then yet, there's water everywhere. How is that possible? So again, NASA hides these things. Because in, um, it was it 2009, I think, when they published this, that, that they found sprawling clouds of cold water vapor around a burgeoning solar system nearby called Hydri. <laughs> Hydra. Hydra. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> the water vapor could eventually deliver oceans to the dry planet. Dry planets that are forming in that solar system. So they're just telling us that there's actually water out there. And then, but they've actually been telling us that there's water all around our whole solar system, isn't it? Our entire solar system is surrounded by water in the form of ice. Firstly, we have the Kuiper belt, which is just you know trillions and trillions of, of pieces of ice floating around there like this... This, like, this, this belt around our so, uh, the ex extreme part of our solar system. And then that is within another big cloud of water or ice called the Oort Cloud. So you get the Kuiper Belt, and then the Kuiper Belt and the entire solar system sits in the Oort Cloud that surrounds the entire solar system. So, so they tell us that this, this solar system called Hydri is surrounded by water, and then actually our entire solar system is surrounded by water and it looks probably something like this. So, and there's another nice uh, artistic impression of what our solar system may actually look like. The entire thing is possibly made up of water. And suddenly, 
I have a very different take on the opening statement of the Bible. The Spirit of God moved over the waters. I could never understand that. What does that mean? How come there's water? Nothing has been created. He hasn't even said, let there be light. You know, and yet there's already water. So suddenly, Scripture takes on a very different, different kind of meaning to me. And is it possible that all of space... Or that water is the stuff that holds the universe together. If the Spirit of God moved across the waters. So what is it what, that we look at when you look up at the night sky? I don't know anymore. I don't believe anything anymore. I'm starting to question everything. And suddenly this thing called a vacuum that we are told that space is, becomes part of the myth. And not a scientific fact. How many of you have been into space? A handful of people that claim they've been to space. Can we believe them? I don't know. How many of you believe that these pictures are actually taken on the moon? Is there, are there any people that believe that these pictures are taken on the moon? So don't be ashamed. If you do, put your hand up because it's, it's important. There's one person that believes it's taken on the moon. So it shows you. The, the lies of NASA are starting to affect us dramatically, and we no longer believe anything they tell us. So if the moon landings were faked, which by now you should know they were shot by all the moon landings that we've seen, all the images that we've ever seen of the moon landings were shot by Stanley Kubrick on the set of Space Odyssey 2001 in England. If you don't know that, please I urge you to watch uh, Jay Widener's spectacular documentary called The Kubrick Odyssey. It's, it is truly the best documentary on that subject. And um, so if we, if we fake the moon landings, how many of us believe that we actually landed on Mars and these little things were put on Mars? Right? Who believes that? I for one don't. I now believe that all that stuff was actually shot in northern, shot in northern Canada on Devon Island that they staged this entire Mars landing and all these if you go and go and research this you'll see this is exactly where they were this was the training area for the Mars landing and they were training with actual pros that were going to go to Mars were being used here so all the footage we think we saw from Mars is actually from this place here so all this stuff is bogus nonsense that keeps us enslaved in a never-ending web of lies and deceptions but through all the lies and deceptions, there is one common denominator that remains the source of all things. And this is where it gets really exciting. Sound and resonance, the common links of creation. Modern science tells us that we live in an electromagnetic universe. Everything spins and vibrates. I'd like to correct that. I'd like to say that it's not an electromagnetic universe. It's a magnetoelectric universe. It's a very big difference between the two. And again, it's a small little subtlety, but it's a very important subtlety because magnetism is a thing that rules the universe, not electricity. Sound, magnetism, electricity. And you'll see how this chain reaction causes everything that we observe when we look up at the night sky or the nature around us. Everything in creation spins and vibrates. Everything has its own prime resonance fr frequency. Everything. And this is why once we can identify a prime resonance frequency of a bacterium or, a, or an atom or a whatever it is or a soccer field, we can then manipulate that, that, that object with its prime resonance frequency. Sound and resonance, common links of creation and religion. In Christianity, it's the word. In Hinduism, it's Om. The Egyptians believed the universe was sung into creation and the original people of Australia, not the Ab original, forgot to take the ab out. They're not abnormal. they the original people of Australia. It's a twist on words there, remember? Keep that in mind. So it's the original people of Australia believe that the world was um, created with three sacred songs. And then we have the phenomenal uh, similarities between the six days of creation uh, in Christianity uh, and the word that created everything. The six aspects of Om, and the six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. And you start seeing the connections between all these ancient cultures and the creation stories. 
And then the creation stories get even more interesting when you read the Hindu creation story. It says, everything was so peaceful and silent that Vishnu slept undisturbed by dreams or motion. From the depths, a humming sound began to tremble. It grew and spread, filling the emptiness and throbbing with energy. The night had ended. Vishnu awoke. It's just a little more dramatic version of saying, God said, let there be light. <laughs> Same thing. It's just great when you start seeing these connections. Sound is a source of all creation. Sound and resonance is responsible for everything. It is the breath of the Creator, the prime resonance frequency and the source code for everything in creation, including our DNA. And our, this is from uh, Dan Winter's brilliant uh, documentaries and work on the DNA and sound and resonance. I would recommend you check out Dan Winter's work on that as well. How cymatics and sound helps to form and shape our DNA and the structure of our DNA based on the cymatics. And that word cymatics, it comes from Hans Jenny in the 50s and 60s, the brilliant work that he did and showed us how sound and resonance is responsible for everything in creation. By now you should know that sound manifests physical form and this is the most basic example. I think you might have to manipulate the sound here, it might get a bit hectic. If your ears are sensitive, just block your ears because it could get a bit loud. This is the most basic fundamental um, demonstration how sound and resonance manifests into physical form. And I, can, I just cannot get enough of it. I can watch it millions of times. Every frequency has its own specific shape. A prime resonance frequency. Are you only looking at a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional effect? I think he actually uses rice on a metal plate here. And this is just in the spectrum that we can hear. You can imagine in the low frequencies that we can't hear, it has the same effect. The higher the frequency, the more complex the, the, the shapes. The lower the frequency, the, 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 base, the more basic and the larger the shapes. The wavelengths get shorter and shorter as you get, go higher. Wavelength is actually also, it just doesn't quite do it, you know, because it's, it's not really a wave that we're dealing with here. It's something very different, far more complex. It's almost at the edge of our... Okay, so the original people of Australia have a creation story that says time began when the supernatural beings awoke and broke through the surface of the earth. So imagine the surface of the earth being something like this, that metal plate being the surface of the earth and the supernatural beings broke through the surface of the earth and they created the surface of the earth with three sacred songs. This is from Hans Jenny's brilliant video, um, Cymatics. This is powder on a metal plate. It's not a liquid or a jelly. It's powder. You can see landscapes being formed here over extended periods of time.
mountains can form, valleys, volcanoes, all to do with the sound of the earth coming out of the earth. Now watch that. So it's interesting that that I link this to the Aboriginal people or original people of Australia and the three sacred songs and it's very similar to this picture that I took from an aeroplane flying over Western Australia and you can start seeing how the kind of landscape would have been formed from the cymatics of the, the sound of the earth itself. And then Eric Larson is the guy that created the, the cymoscope and this is when you can suddenly see how the human voice has potential to create infinitely. That with our voice we have the potential to create everything and anything we can imagine. That we are indeed creators. And remember every thought you have also has a frequency and a vibration as a resonance. Just like your voice. shape manifests in the toroidal shape. Now we'll move on. And some of these pictures, the images of the of this um, cymoscope images show, give, tell us that it was these sounds, the images of the sound that actually inspired religious symbols, that beautiful cross in a circle at the center of some of these cymatic photographs give us a very clear indication that the creators of the religious symbols knew exactly what they were talking about, that the source of, of, of creation is sound itself. And that takes us to what sound does. Sound pretty much does everything you can imagine because it's a source of creation. Do you guys want to take a break? Anybody want to take a break? If you want to take a break, just go stand at the back, do some stretching exercises. <laughs> I like some people are doing. Um, <clears throat> if you have any questions, I suggest that you just leave it because there's... I'm about halfway through. <laughs> Ancient civilizations understood sound and frequency and they used it for everything. They used it as a tool and they also used it to control and manipulate humanity. This is nothing new. We know by now that the pineal gland is, is pretty much what represents the all-seeing eye of Horus. It's a receiver, it's a transmitter, it's a powerful tool that we should be using but we're not because it was manipulated with and, and probably compromised. And it seems that these ancient beings, these either bird-headed beings or winged beings, used these cone-shaped tools and other techniques to manipulate our pineal gland and manipulate our DNA they controlled us, the tree of life or the DNA, and they probably used sound and frequency to do that with. But what's important is to, to look at, so we got a pine cone, a cone-shaped tool in his hand, and that weird wristwatch that has got these 12 cone shapes pointing at the center. And then also this here. This here is, looks just like the stone tools that I've been picking up, a cone-shaped tool on his arm. Seems like everything is encoded here when they, when they draw these or carve these things. It's not just accidental. Everything has got a, a reason why it's there. So you'll realize why that is so important. Because this, this wristwatch with those 12 cones pointing at the middle shows us that they weren't only controlling our thoughts and our minds with sound and frequency and magnetics in ancient times, but we've been doing it for, for ages now. There's your all-seeing eye of Horus, there's your six of, half of that weird wristwatch with the six cones facing the middle, all controlling us with, with, with sound and frequency. And, uh, and this brings us to using sound as a tool in technology. Sound creates light. It's very obvious. We know that God said, let there be light. And you can do this yourself by attaching a speaker to an LED light and see what happens. 
The ankh was used as a healing tool. Um, we know that uh, from, from images like this, um, and there's a lot more to be said about this. The medicine wheel uh, is a cross in a circle that represents sound, that primordial source of sound. The chosen of the Native American healers knew that, that sound could cure and could heal. <clears throat> this is a Sumerian seal of, that represents sound, and also this is where the swastika has its origin in sound and resonance. The Ark of the Covenant was obviously a very powerful sound energy generating device. Um, it, uh, it, was a, it was also a communication device that Moses could communicate with God and with his people when he sat on the mercy seat below the, the, the angels and the, their wings and was also a very powerful device that brought down the walls of Jericho because obviously gave off some sort of a low frequency vibration and then with a blast from a trumpet and a shout the walls came tumbling down so either an electromagnetic pulse or something of that kind that brought the walls of Der Jericho down Royal Raymond Rife, we you should know by now that cured with the man that found the cure for all disease with sound and resonance they were converted to electric impulses and right here in Sedona in a library in Sedona is his handwritten manuscript that you can read all the his handwritten frequencies that he wrote down for cure all the for cures for all the disease this all the different um, uh, cancers uh, this is for diphtheria uh, this is for tuberculosis and so it goes. Lakovsky, the multiple wave oscillator that has got an incredible record of curing all kinds of diseases including cancers and more recently Anthony Holland who in a TED talk in 2011 shows how he cures cancer with sound frequencies. Unfortunately Anthony Holland thought he'd become famous and since then we've not heard anything of him. He sort of disappeared. Uh, he didn't realize that the sound healing of cancer was discovered long before him because he mentions it as a new phenomenon. These are the first videos taken. We showed these videos to our friends in the biology department. They said they hadn't seen anything quite like it. it. Seems to be a new phenomenon. These organisms are being shattered by our electronic signals. This is a harmless organism, almost friendly, a little blepharisma. And normally they're very fast swimmers, but when you approach a frequency to which they are vulnerable, they begin to slow down, then they stop, and then they begin to disintegrate within about three minutes. So first we attack pancreatic cancer. Take a good look at this slide, because the next one will look quite different. After we treat these cells, they change their shape and size, and they begin to grow long, rope-like structures out the sides. They look something like antennas. I call them bioantennas for biological antennas. It's as if the cancer cells are trying to tune in to our signal. We now know that cancer is vulnerable between the frequencies of 100,000 hertz and 300,000 hertz. So now we attack leukemia cells. Leukemia cell number one tries to grow a copy of itself. But the new cell is shattered into dozens of fragments and scattered across the slide. Leukemia cell number two then hyperinflates and also dies. Leukemia cell number three then tries to make another cancer cell. The new cell is shattered and the original cell dies. I think you get the gist of it. Sound continues to, to amaze us. Sound can levitate. By now, you would have seen this many times, just a very quick idea that sound actually does levitate things, but this is not how the ancients used to levitate the very big heavy objects. This is a very different technique used here. This is just pressure waves that can levitate things, very light objects, but it does give you the ability to imagine that sound actually levitates. John Keeley levitated stuff and drilled sound uh, holes with sound in 1888 already. 
Peter Davy boiled water with sound since, two, since 1940, and he died uh, several years ago. Um, sound creates what's known as a star in a jar called sonoluminescence. When you take a sphere of water and you expose it to certain frequencies, it gives off a very, very bright light at the center of the, of the, of the, the water called a star in a jar, which is just absolutely not, not really, not quite what it is. Magnetrons are really just very, very, um, uh, it's called a resonant cavity magnetron that is created through resonance, sound, sound resonance. It creates huge amounts of energy that's used in laser beams, used in microwaves, laser beams, etc. Sound acts as a cloak of invisibility. Sound can make things disappear. This 3D uh, uh, sort of plastic pyramid that they created, when they expose it to certain sound frequencies, anything they put underneath it disappears, becomes invisible. And that makes you wonder if, if that was the original idea for the, the structures of some monasteries. What do monks do in monasteries? They sit and chant. And I've heard from many people that, that, are, that do a lot of chanting and uh, monastery kind of work, whatever that may mean, um, that, <laughs> that, at, that at times when they're in a group and they're chanting, they, they look up and some people are gone. They're not there. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but I've heard that from many people. They, they claim that people simply disappear when they get into a deep state of, of meditation and, and toning. And um, sound creates hurricanes. There are guys, two guys in 2003 that lodged a patent to create hurricanes out of sound, believe it or not. And I believe they were granted their patent to create hurricanes. And miss, maybe this is how they create the weather for us without us even realizing it. And um, creates superclusters, galaxies, supercluster galaxies. This is from NASA from 2003. They say that they found um, a supercluster that was, that was resonating 57 octaves lower than middle C and it is in a key of B flat. I find it interesting. Because B flat is just a semitone up from A. And if A is the first frequency or the source code of creation, and B flat is just a semitone up from that. This is just how my mind works, right? So it's very interesting. Like, so is that like the first basic level of creation up one level from the creative source code itself that becomes visible to us? Who knows? Um, this is what it looks like. These are images that they show us of this galaxy. And it looks just like the, the, sh the, the, the cymatic patterns from Hans Jenny's the Lycopodium powder creating shapes and mountains. There you go. It doesn't look just like that. And it just realize that this is how things create, uh, are created. These are the sound waves that they show us of this galaxy. And if you look at it very carefully, it's a very specific toroidal shape, toroidal pattern. And this is a fantastic one. These kids from college here in the USA that created a sound fire extinguisher. And this is years ago. You would have thought by now the fire brigades would be using it everywhere. We're both graduating from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at George Mason University uh, this coming May. Uh, we're here, we're just going to test out our, our device that we use that uses sound frequencies to extinguish flames. I see this device being applied to a lot of things. First off, I think in the kitchen, it could be on top of a stove top. Um, but eventually, I'd like to see this applied to maybe swarm robotics where it'd be attached to a drone. And that would be applied to forest fires or even building fires where you wouldn't want to sacrifice uh, human life. Professor Brian Mark really stepped in to help us. He just gave us a lot of support. I think as a whole, engineering is, is really just finding solutions to, to comp, you know, finding simple solutions to complicated problems. You know, engineering is all about finding a way to make the impossible possible, so that's what we did. I mean, you'd expect that to be picked up by the fire brigades, wouldn't you? It's like, no way, they're not going to do that. Imagine a big building on fire, just pull up a couple of fire trucks, psh, blast it with sound, and psh, fire is out. That's too easy, you can't do that. We need people to get injured and hurt so we can get insurance claims, we can have hospitals to work, we get the drug companies, everything's got to work. We've got to get the corporate thing to function. We can't just solve the problem. It's not going to work for us. Right? Uh, sound creates volcanoes. This, imagine, the earth is ringing like a bell all the time. 
So these frequencies keep coming out, out of the earth all the time. What do you think creates the volcanoes? What creates the heat underground that creates the volcanoes? More like a bubbling. Heat is just an expression of frequency, right? Actually, that we perceive as heat. Is that sound is actually three-dimensional. <clears throat> We've come accustomed to seeing graphs like this. This depicts sound waves as moving in a two-dimensional pattern. Or here, like a sine wave, which does help us mathematically, but is not a realistic depiction of sound. This would be a more realistic depiction, showing interference from all angles. And this is what happens when you crank it up. High intensity, we can do something sort of like this. As your little volcano. Instead of simply increasing intensity to get... Sound energizes the air that we breathe, and that's actually one of the most exciting discoveries that I've made, is because as you breathe in the air, it always puzzled me, what happens to the oxygen that you breathe in? Why is it that we breathe oxygen in and then we use some part of it and then we breathe oxygen out? What happens? What happens in that process? Uh, we don't use the oxygen up. If we did, we'd be in big trouble because there'd be no bloody oxygen left, right? But uh, so we breathe oxygen in and then you breathe oxygen out. So what part of the oxygen do you actually use? Well, it's the energized part of the oxygen. The, the, and what energizes the oxygen is actually the, the way that you breathe it in. It's the sound of the air that you breathe. Put your hand to your mouth like this, your, your hand to your ear and, and listen. You make a lot of noise when you breathe, but you can't really hear it. And it's that sound of the air as you breathe. As it goes into your lungs, it speeds up all the time. So it's the sound as of the air, and it's speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, because it's getting into thinner and thinner capillaries all the time. So by the time the air reaches the alveoli in your lungs, it's probably moving faster than the speed of light, and it's just full of energy. And it's the sound of that, the energy of that sound that energizes the oxygen. It goes into your bloodstream, and the energy of that oxygen is stripped and then the, the stripped oxygen is released in, back into, into the air. Uh, Luc Montagnier, 2011, spontaneously generated DNA in water with sound frequencies. If you go on YouTube, you can watch one of these latest documentaries where he creates a virus with a sound frequency from Paris to Rome by sending a sound frequency of a virus across a telephone line and they reconstitute the virus that he has in the lab in Paris. They reconstitute the same virus in the lab in, in Rome. Uh, this is just spectacular stuff, right? So now you can see how we can manifest things. We become creators and can manifest anything with sound. And this is why we now know that sound is the ultimate source of free energy. And Nikola Tesla knew this. He knew that the earth rings like a bell. And he used the sound of the earth where, because it constantly rings. It never stops. He used it as a source of energy to create his free energy device. And this is where we realize that sound and magneticism is inextricably connected. It's sound that creates magnetic fields. And moving magnetic fields create electricity. It's in that order that creation seems to happen. So we don't live in an electromagnetic universe. We live in a magnetoelectric universe. And there's a lot, please watch the, the, the DVDs and the videos on, online about the electric universe. That is spectacular research that tell us what the sun is, what the stars are, and how things actually function. So magnets give off sound. Do you, we all know what speakers are. So there you go. You've got electricity. It comes out of a plug. It runs down a wire. It goes into a speaker, a magnet. The magnet reacts, and the magnet makes the air move and creates sound. And the reverse is possible as well. It works one way, and it works the other way. And this is where we start getting into the real understanding of some of the masters. And no matter how I look at it, how much research I do, I keep coming back to one guy that stands head and shoulders above all other researchers and inventors of, I don't know, for how many centuries. And that guy's name is Nikola Tesla. By now, if you don't know him yet, I, bet, I suggest you go and do some research into this guy's work. He says, if you want to find out the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. It's exactly, that's exactly what I've been sharing with you here. Here is a picture of the elect of an electron. There's a picture taken about a, de uh, a decade ago. They tell us that this is a light beam or electron riding a light beam. Can you see a particle anywhere in this picture? 
No, there's no particle. They're resonant waves, and yet they tell us it's an electron. Can you see how we get brainwashed? So this is what Nikola Tesla has to say about the electron from an interview in 1928. On the whole subject of, of, of matter, in fact, Dr. Tesla holds the view that uh, are startingly original. Uh, he disagrees with the concept of atomic theory of matter and does not believe in the existence of an electron as pictured by science. This is a shock to the system. Because we all think oh, electrons are low, oh, electrons, electrons are real. And, uh, and you start seeing an agenda being developed here, an agenda to being developed by mainstream universities, the mainstream scientific fraternity, under the guidance of those that are trying to lie to us and make us believe things that are not so. Um, the Einstein, this is what Einstein has to say about the electrons. In the theoretical treatment of these electrons, we are faced with the difficulty that electrodynamic theory itself is unable to give an account of their nature. For since electrical masses constituting the electron would necessarily be scattered under the influence of their mutual repulsion unless there are forces of another kind operating between them, the nature of which has hitherto remained obscure to us. So he says he sort of, you know, he doesn't quite understand how electrons come into being. And Ed Leeds Kalman, there's another guy that we should pay attention to. Ed Leeds Conlon is the guy that built Coral Castle in Southern Florida. And he built Coral Castle with cone-shaped cool, cone tools, with no ropes and pulleys. Big, ton, big giant stones that weigh up to 30 tons on his own. And he tells us that millions of people all over the world are being fooled by the non-existing electron. And he has a lot more to say about this. And you start seeing that scientists and inventors and researchers over the last 200 years have been vehemently opposed to this whole concept of an electron and the atomic structure that has been forced down our throats and, down all, and through all our educational institutions. That we just take for granted and we accept because we believe the guys that teach us this to be smart and they're not lying to us. We just accept the stuff. Well... <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Mangia Samantha Lawton, who lives in Manchester, wrote this phenomenal book, and I really suggest you get a copy of this if you can and read it. It reads like a novel. It's one of the best books you'll ever read called Punk Science. Um, it's a quick read. And she shows us uh, that everything manifests as a torus in a toroidal field, and including sound. And this is what sound looks like when it manifests as a toroidal field. Sound just like everything else, manifests as a toroidal field, as a torus. And this is why when our hearts beat, we create a toroidal field around our body. And that toroidal field creates an electromagnetic field around our body. And so it goes. This is what the toroidal fields look like or that are created by the sounds we make when we speak. And phenomenal research and work has been done to show us what the different toroidal shapes and, and fields look like of different letters and different sounds, especially vowels. And then as we speak, these toroidal fields that we manufacture and we create with our mouths, infinite forms, infinite shapes, infinite creativity that we, can, that we manifest, actually become scalar waves and scalar technology that go into all of creation and per permeate all of creation instantly. It doesn't take light years for the thoughts we have or the words we speak to permeate all of creation. It happens instantaneously because sound and resonance traverses all of creation instantly. Not like light that takes time to travel through what we believe to be the cosmos. And here are the toroidal shapes of color Incredible work shows us that the different kind of structures and toroids that color actually creates and how it manifests in, in different and the, the various um, sacred geometrical patterns that we've come, uh, become familiar with. And here's the brilliant work of Eric Rankin, uh, and I really suggest you watch his Sonic Geometry documentary. It's fantastic. It's just watch it. It's a half an hour long on YouTube. Watch that. It'll give you a lot more information. But this is how basic shapes, triangles and shapes in nature, how they all have sound and resonance. This is the sound of nature around us. As an experiment, let's take a look at the numbers found in basic geometric shapes 
then apply those numbers as vibration cycles to hear the tones they produce. First, let's listen to what the 180 total degrees contained in a triangle sound like. And here's a squares and circles 360 in cycles per second. A perfect octave up from the triangle. What about the pentagon at 540? That sounds like a harmonic fifth of the other two. That's interesting. What are these tones? They are F sharp and it's perfect harmonic fifth of C sharp. Let's keep going. What does a hexagon 720 sound like? Another F sharp. Here's a seven sided septagon, which totals 900. This is an A sharp which happens to be the note required to complete an F-sharp major chord in perfect three-part harmony. And finally, the octagon, where we get 1080, another C-sharp. Suddenly, geometry is expressed by tones, and these tones just happen to create the most beautiful form of music, a perfect three-part major chord in the key of F-sharp. So, if you watch this, you, he goes into more. He actually shows you the sounds of, of the flower of life and the seed of life and all that. It's just spectacular. So now you start to understand that every time you look at something that's carved out in a rock or a symbol or the caduceus, everything carries its frequency and actually when you're looking at it you're picking up the image and the sound is entering your subconscious through the fact that you're observing it and looking at it so it has an effect on you so when people say oh it's just a stupid symbol no it has a severe effect on you and your subconscious but you're just not aware that it's affecting you because you're picking up the sound frequencies of that image so if somebody shows you a finger you're picking up the sign of that finger and the, the frequency of that image that's an assault on you. It's not just a, a benign little gesture. It's a serious assault on you. So keep in mind, not only your thoughts are powerful tools, but the images and the words you write are powerful tools. The words that we write. This is why the original letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 letters, are very specific shapes and size and, and forms. Each letter is actually a two-dimensional representation of the three-dimensional sound of that letter. It's been reduced to 2D. Now you get a better understanding of how that is possible. So the, the tools that have been given to us of thought, of language, of, of vocabulary, of letters, of the alphabet, are powerful tools and this is why wizards and witches could cast spells with their spelling right cast spells and we do spelling at school so we're actually learning to cast spells without realizing what we're doing and this stuff is just so brilliant when you start breaking this knowledge and this information down you get into the deep understanding of the power that we have the incredible powerful beings that we are because we are one with God we are one with the Creator we come from the same creative source and we are all imbued with all that knowledge and information runs in our DNA and I believe this is my personal belief and there's some cuneiform text suggestions to this that when Enki was trying to hide the so-called ME tablets from those who wanted to destroy it or, or, or possess it, he hid it in a place and he put it in a place that it could never be found or destroyed by others. And where did he put it? He put it in the DNA of the being that he created. We have the knowledge of everything in creation encoded in our DNA. It is all there. We are just accessing it in small bite-sized chunks. If we access it all together, like some people, I guess, do, and then they go insane because they don't know how to deal with it. Start walking the streets mumbling. So we're going to now bust the dogma of science. And remember that science means knowledge. That's all it is. 
Anyone with a deep level of knowledge of anything is a scientist. Get rid of this perception of scientists and guys with white lab coats and all that crap, right? Anyone, if you're a master shoemaker, you're a scientist. If you're a master baker, you're a scientist. If you're a master movie maker, you're a scientist. And we've distorted the meaning of science. The Taurus electron model. This is what an electron actually looks like. It's just a resonance field. Many brilliant work, much brilliant work has been done by many, many brilliant researchers and scientists. Uh, electromagnetic models and formulas have been thrown together that actually that are consistent with the toroidal shape of, a, of, a, of an electron. An electron is simply a coherent resonance in a toroidal field. That's all it is. It's not a particle. It is a resonance toroidal field. A resonating toroidal field. The same with the atomic structure. The, atom, the atom is a toroidal field. It's not the atomic structure that we've been shown by science throughout our schooling careers. This is probably a lot closer to what an atom looks like. Here's a picture of a, a molecular torus of the carbon monoxide molecule. And uh, you start seeing how the toroidal shapes appear everywhere. Here's a toroidal, um, the system, the, the solar system as a torus. And uh, you've, obviously, many of you would have seen the, the fact that our galaxy has shown us to be as a, as a toroidal field. And so it goes. So we, I guess this is probably one of the best descriptions of the nature of our reality and around us. The fractal, multidimensional, toroidal nature of reality. That's a mouthful. But, uh, but this is a beautiful uh, image drawn by Alex Gray, who is just a spectacular artist that has done incredible uh, work. And this just blows. When I see this, this is, this is what I imagine we look at when we look up at the stars and the cosmos. This is a lot closer to the nature of reality that surrounds us than pretty much anything we get shown by NASA. This is all to do with toroidal fields and magneticism. Now, Everything is sound and magneticism, and this is really important. How are you guys holding out? Are you okay? Uh, you're the guinea pigs. This is the first presentation that I'm doing. I realize I'm going to have to, <laughs> I'm going to, have to cut this a lot shorter, but <laughs> I'm testing this on you tonight. Uh, <laughs> and I'm trying, to f I'm trying to see where, which parts I'm going to have to take out to cut this down. But, um, so just hang in here, okay? <laughs> So, what most people don't know is, remember, sound, God said, let there be light. So, it's sound, moving sound, sound manifests as toroidal fields, those two moving toroidal fields create magnetic fields, which are toroidal fields as well, and moving magnetic fields create electricity. That's the sequence of events. But what you, this tells us that because sound creates magnetic fields, it means everything must have a magnetic, uh, must be magnetic in some sort. And in some sort of way. And if it's not, there's a very specific reason why it's not magnetic. So here's an example. This blew my mind when I found this little thing from Los Angeles, from UCLA, I think. It's, this is such an important little video that will change your perception of what our universe or what our reality around us is. And what mag how important a role magneticism plays in everything that surrounds us. You might not think of water as being magnetic, but it is. And so are graphite, aluminum, and glass. This is a new and different category of magnetism called either para or diamagnetism, and it's different from the magnetism that you're used to. You're probably already familiar with ferromagnetism. Ferro means iron. An unmagnetized piece of iron or nickel or cobalt becomes a magnet in the presence of a magnetic field. The effect is strong and lasts even after the magnet is removed. Paramagnetism is a similar effect, except that it's much weaker and temporary. Aluminum is a good example of a paramagnet. And so is oxygen, which is attracted to magnets. Here, I have a few milliliters of liquid oxygen, which sticks to the magnet. I'll explain why later. Gadolinium oxide and cupric sulfate are good examples of paramagnetic substances. Cupric sulfate is a salt that can be picked up by a magnet. 
Diamagnetic materials are exactly the opposite of paramagnetic. They are always repulsed. They would rather die than be in a magnetic field. An important example of a diamagnetic material is graphite. This specially made pyrolytic graphite is repelled by a magnetic field. Don't be confused. This is not static electricity or eddy currents. Graphite is repelled by a magnet, always, both by the north and south end. Pyrolytic graphite is a grown crystal of flat carbon layers which maximizes the diamagnetic effect. Of course, the best diamagnets are superconductors, which at low temperatures provide exact opposite repulsion to whatever magnetic field is present when they're chilled. They are perfect diamagnets. So it gives you an idea how the nature of reality around us is just, we just don't get taught this stuff, you know, we don't think about it in that sense. And how sound is actually the cause of all the stuff that we're witnessing here. And, sorry, let me go back here. You, you might have seen this, this thing before. So this sort of quantum locking is actually just a magnetic effect. You just saw it as a video. So what have we, we got here? So we have quantum locking. The, the superconductor is locked in space and it stays wherever I put it. You see, this is quantum trapping. Amazing. As, as long as it's so the cold, supercondu it's superconducting it's frozen with liquid nitrogen upside down right and it stays locked so the fact that it's it's superconducting is locking the magnetic field in yeah. three dimensions right yeah exactly and that and pivots. You see, because this is a symmetric it can rotate without breaking without break the locking the right. locking doesn't break right because it so it stays there on the the x and y but not on but the, it pivots on the... Yeah, on the axis yeah. of the magnets. You, you see, if yeah. I can move it yeah. on the side, it will again pivot around the axis of the magnet because it makes sure that uh, the magnetic field inside of it stays the same. Right. It's astonishing. Can you put it on the track for us? Yeah. I just levitate it above the track quite high and I can just rotate it. So it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it's not floating, it's locked above the surface. So it could pull, you could tilt it at an angle and it would yeah, fly around. Yeah, like this and it will just go around this like this. This is really heading. Because it go and put it at different height. Put them in like this. And lock it at the height. Lock right. it, yeah, different height, different configuration. Right. And I can even lock it at the uh, opposite way. If you could just hold for a minute. High. I'm doing the so same thing, hang I'm locking down. it upside down, and then it is suspended. Fantastic. So magnetic fields do what? They do exactly what sound does. They create toroidal fields. Just if you do this, you immediately see the toroidal fields being created by magnets around them. Little toruses. And this is a full magnetic Field, toroidal field spectrum. It's both positive and negative on both sides. There is no positive and negative in magnetic fields. This is where we've been incorrectly taught. It's actually just one field that, that work in opposite directions. It's centrifugal, centripetal forces that work towards against each other and oppose each other. And the complete toroidal field, like the toroidal magnetic field like this, has a both positive and a negative on both sides. So it both pushes and pulls from both sides. That's a complete magnetic toroid. It's not north on the one and south on the other. That's an incomplete magnetic field. This is very important information, people. And this, this connects us to some of the biggest lies we've been told about our reality and the world that we live in. Because we've been told that the sound of the earth creates a magnetic field. Sorry, it's the sound of the earth that creates a magnetic field and not, not the molten iron core. There is no molten iron core in the center of the world. That's another theory that's been proposed and most people believe it these days. It's a nonsensical idea. It's a sound of the earth that creates the magnetic fields around us. By now you should know that sounds is the cause of everything and especially magnetic fields. The problem with our world is that 
the Earth magnetic model is a half a magnetic model. It's north at the top and south at the bottom. That's not a complete magnetic field. And as far as I'm concerned, it's impossible for an Earth-like object to be in a complete magnetic field like the toroidal shape of our solar system and be an incomplete magnetic field itself. Can you see why I would say that? It doesn't make any sense <laughs> that our Earth is a half a magnetic field, an incomplete magnetic field, floating around in a complete magnetic field called our solar system. It would correct itself and over billions of years become a balanced toroidal magnetic field. How that would affect the shape of the Earth, I don't know. I'm going to let you figure that out. But this is what a complete and balanced toroidal magnetic field looks like. And what it does, it has an accretion disk in the middle. There you can see that yellow accretion disk. That's the center of the magnetic field. Whichever way you turn it, it's the same. As above, so below. We start to understand some of these basic fundamentals of creation, all coming from the breath of God, the breath of the Creator, the words that we utter. Everything that we say and create has the same effect, creating these complete, perfect magnetic fields. The Taurus equator plane emits energy and matter at its disk, as a disk at the equator. We accept this in the solar system. All the matter in the solar system is emitted at the equator. All the planets go out in this one disk from the sun that rotate around the sun. And the same in the, in the galaxies. The many, many galaxies that we've been shown, photographs, they're all toroidal shaped galaxies with the matter all spewing out at the galactic equator. We're even told that we are crossing the galactic equator because our solar system does this. And we cross the galactic equator. I no longer believe that, but in any case. But so the half truths and half lies being woven together here. And we need to now figure out which is true and which is no longer, which is a lie that we've been spun. This is some of the most beautiful new work. Um, Viewing, being able to actually see what a magnetic field looks like through the ferro lens. This is a quite a new discovery, only about 10 years old. Now we can actually see what magnetic fields look like. This is when you look at a torus. This is what a torus magnetic field looks like. You can see. See the magnetic fields. Some people would call this the ley lines on the surface of the earth. You can actually see the magnetic fields. So I'm suggesting that people that are reading ley lines are actually picking up the magnetic fields that crisscross the toroidal field of our planet. And the ancients knew this. They put all the ancient sites and all these magnetic lines because they, 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 their ancient structures were actually driven by these magnetic lines and these toroidal field, these magnetic lines. You know what I mean. Uh, when you look at the cone-shaped magnetic field under a ferrocell, look at this. When you take a ferrocell and you put it over a, a speaker, uh, like a speaker magnet, look what it does. These beautiful cone shapes that face the middle, just like, just like what? Just like this guy's wristwatch. Can you start seeing why I'm suggesting that these guys are using technology? It was in their wristwatches, they had the cones, all to do with magneticism and sound. We just never saw it like that until we got the ferro cell given to us. And when you bring a magnet towards a ferro fluid, what does the ferro fluid do? It forms beautiful cones <laughs> and just stick right out the ferro fluid. <laughs> and this stuff just gets better and better. And now you start seeing how sound and magneticism plays a role in nature in structuring the flowers and the shapes of trees and, and everything around us is driven by sound and the magnetic fields that actually create the shapes around us. Are you guys getting excited yet? Yeah. About how this stuff works and what we've been missing. So, this brings me to the ancient tools and artifacts and the Taurus stones and the cone-shaped tools. Now suddenly you have a very different take on when I get excited about the cone-shaped tools and how, why Ed Leed Skalman, when I was told that he, he, was, um, he was seen levitating the giant rocks with these cone-shaped tools and ice cream cones, I got extremely excited because I understood what it means. And, uh, and I've been picking up these cone-shaped tools everywhere 
and suddenly you realize that play, they play a very important role in all of human history. This is, from a, the, this is from an iron mine in England. These are cones in Egypt. They were completely ignored until I found them. Uh, cones in Australia. Mayan deity holding two cones, just like Edlitz Kalnan was apparently seen. These cone-shaped hats that are found in some tribes that were used for special ceremonies. Why do wizards have hats? As cones and why do wizards ones why are wizards ones um, cone shaped and this is, gets really exciting dragonflies we you know we think of birds flying and and bees yeah, you you may be aware of the fact that it's actually a scientific impossibility for bees or bumblebees to fly because their wings don't they can't carry that body weight so this has been a mystery so I'm gonna bust that mystery for you because dragonflies just like bees and bumblebees and other insects or bugs like that have actually hollow tubes in their wings. Those are not veins filled with blood. Those are hollow tubes that do what? They resonate. When, they, when the dragonflies uh, buzz their, their wings, they don't flap them, they just bzzz, they vibrate. It sends vibrations through their wings and through those hollow tubes, and at the bottom of those hollow tubes, they got thousands of tiny cones that stick out, that send out these, these these sound waves or sazer beams, we're going to get to that, that create, that create magnetic fields around them. And this is why they can buzz around. Viktor Grubinikov was, became famous in the, I think it was in the 50s, when he studied the bugs, uh, the wings of bugs and bees, and he was fascinated by it. And then he built what, he, what became a very famous levitation platform. And he was seen and flying this thing faster than the speed of sound on one of those right and people think this is crazy and how did he what was it made of it was made of bugs wings so when you tell people oh he built this out of bugs wings people go <laughs> what kind of nonsense is that you're a bunch of idiots and you believe that well show you he understood how these bugs wings worked and how they actually functioned and that's why he could build such a device because he thought out of the box and this is to show you some experiments how these bugs wings actually have levitation capacity just this is mind-blowing today we're going to try to get one of these shells to hover over the other one um, the original of this video um, is what inspired me to do this series Nature is fabulous. <laughs> so there you have an idea how Viktor Grabenikov built his little levitation device out of bugs wings because he figured out how these things work. And then we get to the cone-shaped tools in the Rosicrucian Museum. Somebody emailed me today say, hey, he went and he saw these, tool, these, these cones in the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose and they're really there. So he was surprised that I wasn't making it up. <laughs> he says, I blew his mind. <laughs> Yeah, and they are written, they, can you see cuneiform texts that actually commemorate the building of the temples in Sumer and one of them specifically refers to the temple of Inanna. So somehow they were used just like Edlitz Kalnan was levitating the giant rocks of Coral Castle. They were using these to levitate those giant stones of the temples of Sumer into place. And here is our friend Edlitz Kalnan, Coral Castle. And he levitated those giant blocks. I think the biggest stone there weighs 30 tons or maybe even more. And I called it the ice cream cone phenomenon because that's what he was described. He was, he was, it was said that he moved them with ice cream cones in his hands. And to an uninitiated person that would sound ridiculous. But now you all know why that is so important. It's a spectacular place. I've never been there but I've seen lots of videos of it and I can't wait to go. Uh, and then we get to our Torah stones, our sacred Torah stones, which are clearly not weights for digging sticks. And they are far more important. They are very, very powerful toroid vortex field generators. They generate huge amounts of energy around them. Just like our galaxy, just like our solar system, just like our bodies, just like our hearts create toroidal fields around our bodies. And these, they seem to suck in the the ambient sound around them and actually amplify that. 
They create scalar vortex, uh, vortex technology. That's really what they are. So please understand this, that at the, at the center of that torus is what, what some call the zero point or the, or the, the, the vacuum as, as, um, as Nassim Haramein calls it. That's where we enter into the, the infinite density of creation. As, and Nassim has shown very, very successfully with his uh, papers that the density of the vacuum, where everything out of that point out of which everything manifests into reality, into this much, much less denser thing that we think is our reality, our body, which is actually empty, just full of a bunch of atoms and whatever it is, just resonating, that the point out of which, out of which everything manifests has infinite density. That's a zero point. So now you can understand why sound travels infinitely, because in an infinite density, sound and resonance travels infinitely fast, but light travels infinitely slowly. So that's a very quick way to figure out why sound and resonance travels instantly, because it goes into the zero point of every, of, every, of every atom in our body. As we think, as we speak, it enters all that inside us, and it enters the zero point and the fabric of all creation, and traverses everything instantly. So this when these tor toroidal shapes work, they suck in the ambient sound and they create, and, and as, it, as, they get, as it hits <laughs> those two points hit each other, they create this, this, this next scalar wave around it, and it comes around and it, it enters it again, but it happens simultaneously. So it's a, this actual field that sits there all the time, just resonating. So it looks something like that. And, um, and this is one of the stones that we put in a bucket of water and the next morning it had these thousands of bubbles that were swirling around, moving into the center of the stone. And then you may have heard the story of Nassim Haramein when I took him the stone and this stone over there, uh, when I flew via Doha to Chicago, by the time I, I got off at Doha and, and, and got onto the plane to go to Chicago, the plane was delayed and eventually I was called off the plane because um, because they said there was a security threat in my bag and there were five guns, five guys with guns around my bag and they made me open my bag. Uh, we were already 20 minutes delayed and by the time I opened my bag, I took the, the tourist stone out and I said, oh God, what am I going to tell them? And I said, oh, it's, it's uh, uh, African arts and crafts, you know, it's just uh, it's a present for my friend. And uh, by the time I got back on the plane, uh, when we sat down, my partner told me that when the captain came out of the cockpit, he said that whatever is in that bag crashed the TSA security system. That's why they delayed the plane for 20 minutes. They wouldn't let us take off until they found the owner of that bag and what was in that bag. What I didn't figure out until like two years afterwards is like they didn't even question what was... I pulled out the stone and you know, sweating profusely because they're five guys with guns and the stone was wrapped in like bubble wrap and backing tape so it was not easy to open it up. And you know, I felt like a drug dealer because it looked like you know, <laughs> movies or the drugs backed in. And eventually the stone popped out and it's like, okay, cool, put it back. They never, they never asked me to check the rest of my bag. They, they, it's, they knew what they were looking for. I've only figured this out a lot later, you know, because you... You process, reprocess this, and you go, oh my God, they knew exactly what they were looking for, and, and they just let it go. But, um, so we basically have TSA security, Homeland Security USA, to thank for, to proving us, giving us scientific proof that these are advanced ancient technologies. It apparently shut down the entire office. It put, blew down, you know, shut down all their computers. Everything was shut down because of some sort of weird electromagnetic pulse that was given off by that, by that stone. And I have a present for you because I brought that stone with me. This is it. Thanks to Mark over there that drove all the way to, to um, Vegas to fetch the stone. The stone has been sitting with Nassim for a long time. I thought they would do some research with it, but they didn't. I'm now going to take it back to South Africa and we're going to start a series of research programs with the stone because we know that this is the one that actually worked. This is the stone. What I can tell you is that two um, scientists, one in, uh, Slovenia, one in Croatia and one in um, Germany, two scientists that are experts in a new study of sound called hypersound, 
which very few people are even aware of, sound that becomes a very, very powerful tool at high frequencies and high, uh, high levels of uh, speeds. Um, that um, hypersound is a tool that can be used for pretty much everything in, in our society. And that brings us to the next slide, and that's Sazer technology. And I believe that these Taurus stones had everything to do with creating ancient advanced Sazer technology, or the energy fields that were then focused to create Sazer technology through the cone-shaped tools, creating a Sazer beam. So this creates the energy that goes into the, that cone-shaped tool that then creates the Sazer beam and pushes it out of the tip of that tool. I've had lengthy discussions, hours and hours of discussions with some of the smartest physicists and scientists in Germany and in Croatia when I was on tour there, how this technology works. And let me tell you, they are so excited about this. They just want to lay their hands on these cone-shaped tools and these stones. So we're going to have to do some serious research. But guess what? You need money for that. So what I'm going to do starting next year is start a whole internship program to do more research on the ancient ruins and the tools and the artifacts and so forth. And I'm going to do like three months a year of intensive internships where we're going to do loads of exciting research from genetics to botany to soil science to electronics to etc. etc. Archaeology, archaeoastronomy, geology, it's all the different principles together to show all the people from the different areas how everything is connected and how their respective um, faculties have, have, have boxed them into boxes, not allowing them to think out of the box and realize how their area of research and knowledge is connected to everything else. We're going to cross those boundaries. But this is getting quite heavy. <laughs> So, a bigger button. Uh, it's, uh, we can, you know, you can come and hold it later, just um, uh, at gunpoint. <laughs> I'm not letting that thing out of my sight ever again. <laughs> so, um, so, we're dealing with some ancient knowledge that's giving us a very clear indication of how we can use this ancient technology into the future. Keep in mind, what have we got in our eyes? In our eyes, we have rods and cones in our retina, right? What are the cones in our retina uh, connected to? The optic nerve is connected to? Is connected to? Right in the middle of your brain is your? Pineal gland. Correct. Correct. So somehow our pineal gland should be controlling our eyes and our optic nerve. And our pineal gland should be picking up all these other frequencies. They're all seeing our Horus connecting us to everything, every frequency, and giving us ESP ability and much more. But we can't do that because those bastards several thousands of years ago screwed up our, our, our um, pineal gland with those cones, cones of theirs. But if you look at our eyes, so in our eyes, in the iris, the iris is actually like toruses. Right? Look at the toruses in our eyes. And the toruses have lenses in them that focus the light, which is also sound, because every light frequency has a sound frequency attached to it. So it, it sends the sound and the light through the lens, through the center of the torus, into the cones in the retina. So now you understand why I get excited about these toruses or the cones combined as tools that we could be used to do things that we can't even imagine yet. We've got this technology encoded in ourselves, and this is why when I say that we are advanced technology, people don't get it. We are the most advanced technological tools walking around on this earth. It's encoded in us. Our DNA has all the knowledge of everything in creation that was put there by Enki. And those bastard Anunnakis that turned us into their slaves, but it seemed to be back here kicking butt with all those other entities that are causing trouble for us. But that might be too much information for some people. But what this all leads up to is that we should be able to do anything. We should be able to think anything and manifest it instantly. We should be able to use our eyes like Superman and do stuff like this. We are absolute ultimate creators. We are co-creators of our own reality. And I'm getting totally distracted here, but I get excited about this. And this brings us to the question, what are the stone ruins all about? Are you guys tired? Do you want to... Uh, this is... 
<laughs> I'm not sure which of these, which of this I'm going to have to cut out, but I'm getting tired myself. But um, <laughs> so I know it, it's it's much too long. It's already twenty past nine. So I'm going to. I've got about uh, half an hour to go, and we'll be out of here. So what are the stone circles all about? By now you can see that clearly we're dealing with cymatic patterns. Very obvious we're dealing with cymatic patterns. That's what every stone circle is. It's just a representation of the sound frequency that comes out of the earth at that specific point. That's what this is all about. And some of these cymatic, like sand on a metal plate, but now these are stones, right? Some of the, some of the st uh, structures are actually very distinct magnetrons. And of those flower shapes. Every time you see a flower shaped stone circle, it means they actually built an ancient giant magnetron like this. Magnetrons that can, that can cut metal in a split second. And I asked two magnetron scientists, how much energy would a magnetron 40 meters in diameter generate? Remember that a tiny magnetron can create so much energy in a laser beam that cuts metal in a split second. I mean, it literally just melts the metal. Bzz. And, uh, and the answer was that a magnetron that size would create more energy than all the power plants on Earth together combined. One. We have thousands of these magnetrons in Southern Africa. Thousands of them. So these guys are generating so much energy. It's insane. And we know this because we, we measured it. We measured the sound frequencies, the electromagnetic fields, the loudness and decibels. And it's just insane what's coming out of these stone circles. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with that because it's just, you know, it's getting late. Adam's calendar is the most powerful of all these ancients of these stone circles. Adam's calendar is actually much, much more powerful. It's as if they all seem to be sending their frequencies to Adam's calendar. And that's like the collection point for all this, the energies created by all these millions of stone circles. That's what it seems like. I can't say it is, but that's what it seems like, because the frequencies there were just ridiculous. Beyond 375 gigahertz coming out of Adam's calendar at, at the site. And electromagnetic fields that run horizontally and then vertically between the two stones in the middle. So what we have at Adam's calendar is a very definite toroidal effect. And it's alive even today, because we measured it. And... Um, and that reminds us that the stones that ring like bells are what? They're just crystals. They're very, very high in crystalline substance. Very rich in quartz and silica. And remember, silica carries memory. Quartz carries memory. You can store virtually infinite amount of information and knowledge in quartz crystals. And this is why they don't put them in our computers, because that would make the computer industry obsolete. You know, that you buy a computer once and never again. And that's what we're going to do in our Ubuntu communities, build bloody supercomputers. So, because we know how to make them. So when you look at ancient structures built out of stone, you realize that these guys knew exactly what they were doing. They understand that stone is the tool that carries with it, in it, information, storage capacity. It's an energy source. And that's why they used stone. Not because they were stupid, because they were very, very smart. We're the dumb ones, but we're catching up quite quickly. So what's very obvious now is that all these ancient structures from the pyramids, Borobudur, etc. are all ancient machines. They were giant machines built out of stone, crystalline substance, for, to create or to perform specific functions. It's just the function that we haven't figured out. What were they built for? Why were they, what were they supposed to you know, um, do? And this is why they are uh, are aligned with the movement of the sun. Because we're always amazed, yeah, look, this is aligned with the equinoxes and solstices and all this. And we think, oh, because they worship the sun. Oh, no, stupid. This is our stupid way of imagining that the ancients were stupid. They built this machine because the machine was aligned with the sun, because the sun is the, is the activator of these machines. When the sun rises on the equinox over there and the first sun beams come down this passage and hit the standing stone, which is a crystal, you know that because the, all stones have crystal in them. So it's like hitting enter on your computer. Bim! It switches the machine on. And the machine does whatever function it's supposed to do until the sun moves over there and then, and then the beam comes through another passage and then hits another, the, the sun, uh, the light and the sound of the sun beam or sunlight hits another stone and it makes, makes the machine either stop whatever it was doing or do perform some other function. And this is why they are aligned with the movement of the sun. 
So they work whether they're being operated or not. We don't have to sit there and wait and, and keep making it work. It works on its own. It's powered by the sound of the earth and activated by the movement of the sun. I mean, it's bloody brilliant. It's so simple. And now we're figuring this out and we know that the energies are still there because this is a photograph taken of the pyramids and there's still huge energy coming out of the pyramids. Even the symmetrical patterns coming out of Stonehenge, although Stonehenge has been completely reconstructed, there's still very powerful symmetrical patterns coming out of Stonehenge that tells us that its original structure is still, was very specifically created as a resonating device, an energy device. And now we get to the very exciting earth grid that is, seems to connect to all these ancient sites on Earth. By now you should know that this is a magnetic grid. It's not just ley lines or some fancy... Blah, blah. It's actually very specific energetic patterns that are created by the resonance of the Earth and the magnetic fields that, it's create, that it creates. And it, it, the ancients seem to build all these ancient sites on these nodal points and very powerful points uh, on, the, on these magnetic grids. And this is a, an ancient Sumerian text that actually tells us a lot of very important information. <clears throat> this is a real text that comes from the Shoyan collection. And it says, In the distant days, in those days after destinies had been decreed, after Un and Enlil had set up regulations for heaven and earth. I mean, regulations for heaven and earth. And Enki, the exalted knowing God, um, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, he set up cities. It, seems to tell us that there was some sort of a fixed energy grid in the sky, heaven, and the fixed energy grid on the earth. And based on the energy field in the sky and the earth, they, they set up the cities on earth on these specific nodal points. And then David Wilcox several years ago discovered that the, the, the emblems of the Space Command and the Air Force and so forth in the USA refer to the rules. And they have these, these bands around the earth, these, these white bands with these little delta shapes on them. And, these, and they refer to those bands around the, wor the, the world as the rules. And they say there's some sort of energetic field around the world. They don't know where it comes from, but it's always been there. Some sort of energetic field up in the sky that this, this same Sumerian text seems to refer to. They built the cities according to this energetic grid. And here we have the same rules. Read there. It says, the fixed rules, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, they set up the cities. And here we have the fixed rules in the sky on the military and air force logos. And my friend Paul Gravenstein in South Africa, who's a remarkable guy, but we don't have time for me to talk about him. Um, he actually measured these rules or these energy grids in the sky. He phoned me out of the blue and he was freaking out. He said, I don't know how to tell you this. I don't know who else to tell, but I, measured, I've me I picked up this bloody energy grid that's up in the sky. It's just everywhere. It's like a matrix. It's like it consists out of ones and zeros. It's like a binary code, powerful energy field up in the sky. And he said he, he sent up a few, energy, a few energy beams or these devices to try and break it. He says it breaks up momentarily and, and it instantly reforms. You cannot destroy it. He says you can't break it. It's, you can't. it's indestructible. And I just realized <clears throat> that all this ancient stuff that we're dealing with, just like I said, these ancient machines are just advanced technology on a gigantic scale. These obelisks in Egypt, they ring like bells if you listen to them. They very, very, they, they ring like bells, just like those stones in my museum. And, uh, and when you go into these temples in Egypt, you know, we told that they were built for this and offering. It's all nonsense, offering and praying. And, it's just too many pillars, not enough space. When you look at them from this angle, you realize that this is just something very different. And all those pillars clustered together, why would they build them like that? And then the more I looked at it, the more I realized, now inspired by realizing that the stone circles were powerful energy generating devices, suddenly seeing aerial photographs of these temples in Egypt, I realized that they weren't temples, but they were actually templates. That we're actually looking at gigantic energy circuits circuit boards on a gigantic scale that we could never have imagined. It's just beyond our imagination. The scale that these guys were building things on is something way out of our perception because we just don't have enough money to do that. <laughs> and macro processes, 
Uh, gigantic macro microprocessors become gigantic macro processes. You know, and, and here uh, we are told that these were these were places of worship and then this is where the people lived. No, these are giant bloody macro processes and that's part of the circuit board. You know, it's what it is. And you can start seeing that the pyramids were the same thing. Giant power powerhouses um, creating huge amounts of energy. And just, you know, you start seeing things and recognizing how all this fits into ancient history. Saksai Huaman is also just a giant circuit board. When you look at images um, from the air, you realize it's just a giant circuit board. It's not a, a fortress on top of a mountain to, to ward off marauding crowds and guys and horses and spears. No, it's a giant circuit board. And Borobudur in Indonesia, I mean, look at this. This is just insane. It's like a, just by looking at it, you see it actually resonating in front of your eyes. It's actually moved and moves. And look at the top of Borobudur. <laughs> that doesn't tell you that these are energy generating devices shooting stuff into the sky. So all of these ancient temples and structures somehow were built, or many of them, to generate energy and shoot it up, shoot it up into the sky. So it's, it seems like it's these are the devices that seem to keep this energy grid up in the sky. And possibly this is a matrix that keeps us enslaved and dumbed down and, and unaware of what's going on outside of our own planet. What is, it, what is actually out there? What are we looking at when we look up at the sky? As I said, I no longer believe anything that NASA shows me. And it seems that the human sound was actually the, the, the source of the energy that holds up the matrix in the sky. Because you find these, these beautiful um, amphitheaters attached to what used to be these circuit boards. So they get a bunch of people into these amphitheaters, get them excited, they make a lot of noise, and they channel that sound into the, the, the circuit board. It activates the, the machine and it starts to make a noise or whatever and shoots the energy up into the sky upholds the matrix. There's beautiful amphitheater, beautiful resonating pillar of, of a row of pillars that used to feed into the circuit board. And so it goes. There's another one. The circuit board was on top of the mountain and the, the source code for it was the amphitheater on the side. Here's another amphitheater right in the middle of a circuit board. This is in Algeria, North Africa. And since 2015, oh, this is, shows you, I should update this. Nothing has changed in 2017. <laughs> the templates and temples have just become churches. And if you look at the tops of churches and mosques, they just have cones, these cones that face the sky, <laughs> that capture the sound and the energy of the people in the church. Look at those cones facing the sky. It's just spectacular. Capture the sound and the energy of the singing and the clapping and the fear and the anxiety. And especially these ones here. This is the mother of them all. <clears throat> and then business centers and cities. They're just designed to, to channel all the sound and energy up into the sky. Somehow this, just nothing has changed. We seem to continue putting all this energy, the city grids are like giant circuit boards. Generating huge amounts of noise, huge amounts of energy. And strangely enough, all being connected by these channels <laughs> called highways that never stop making a noise, just like the stone circles, we never stop making a noise. And now I understand what Morpheus meant when he said that people are the source of energy. It makes a whole different kind of sense to me now. For, who, for whom and why, I don't quite know, but it seems that we're the energy source that keeps this matrix or this energy field around our planet or up in the sky and that brings me back to the deception that's been woven for us over thousands of years and especially the last few hundred years and this whole thing of gravity and the reality that we find ourselves in. You know, Isaac Newton had, had almost no knowledge of magneticism. He, he actually mentions that he didn't understand it and therefore, therefore he didn't write about it. If he only understood magneticism, he would not have come up with the crap that we now has been shoved down our throats. Gravity doesn't exist. It's all an, it's all an aspect of magneticism. But you can't say this at any institution. 
We observe it, we can't explain it. It's called gravity. It just you know, holds everything together. And it's there to support some very, very important philosophies that have been shoved down our throats about the world that we find ourselves in. In fact, Coulomb describes gravity as an electro electric phenomenon. And it's very eloquently ex explained and very easily explains all the activities around us, especially supporting the whole toroidal structure of our reality. Gravity is much easier explained and explains all aspects of our reality through magneticism and not through this invisible, undefinable thing called gravity. Sound creates magnetic fields, moving magnetic fields create electricity, everything is affected by magneticism, sound and resonance. And therefore gravity is a consequence of sound and magneticism and this is why it should be called the magneto-electric universe and not the electromagnetic universe. Even the processional wobble of, of, our, of our planet, remember we talk about the procession of the equinoxes, this 26,000 year wobble. Even that can be explained with magneticism because magnetic fields have their own processional wobble like is explained here. It's spectacular how suddenly everything changes in our reality. And we can start looking at the world we find ourselves in very, very differently. In 1887, there was a very important experiment that was performed. And I'm almost finished here, people. So you can, you can just relax. This is, this is the home run. This just blows my mind. Okay. And in 1887, these two brilliant scientists, and they were pretty much, pretty much pushed out of our knowledge pool, out of our psyche. Mickelson Morley performed what, what became a very important experiment because until then all scientists around throughout the ages were obsessed with the ether. It was known it was called the ether. The ether, the breath of creation, the exist what holds everything together, what holds creation together, what holds the planets in place and so forth. And it was called the ether. And they were obsessed with the ether and they couldn't quite understand what the ether was. They, and they had all kinds of definitions for it. If only they understood that it was vibration and resonance. That's really what they were describing, was the ether, is vibration and resonance. The breath of the Creator that holds everything in perfect harmony and, and coherent, resonant harmony. So, my, Mickelson Morley experiment was performed to prove the existence of the ether. And they wanted to prove that the Earth moves through the ether. Well, they did two very important things. First of all, they couldn't find the ether. They couldn't prove that the ether existed. And they did this with sending out light beams in perpendicular directions, and they were measuring the movement of the light bouncing back, and they found there was no movement. I'm giving it to you a very, very basic English, so it's easy to understand. You can go and research this yourself. And what came back is that there was no movement. There was no deflection, nothing. So. The conclusion was that the Earth is not moving through space. Therefore, the ether does not exist. So I'm not worried about the ether too much because by now we understand that it's resonance and sound. But the most important thing that they showed is that the Earth does not move through space. And as we sit here in this room right now today, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever that has been proven beyond any shadow of doubt, other than the evidence that we've been shown by NASA or the other space agencies. By now we know who they are and who, is, who controls them. There is no scientific evidence that the Earth actually moves through space. I told you I'm going to push you beyond uh, some of our capacity, break down the walls of our own, own resistance. This has really shocked me. And I no longer believe anything. Even Mika Koku says, or what, how you, Michio Kaku, sorry, <laughs> says that there is no scientific evidence presented today that, that tells us unequivocally that the Earth moves through space. What the hell is this all about? What it does tell us that ether has been replaced by the particle physics universe. And we can start seeing the agenda that was put in place a few hundred years ago, starting with the concept of gravity that replaces magneticism. Start, then, then we start seeing the discovery of the electron. In 1897, 
uh, where J.J. Thompson discovers the theoretical particle, the electron. Never proven to exist, but the theoretical particle suddenly becomes a reality. And a few years later, you know, let me remind you, do you see anything physical in the picture of the electron? No. And this is why people like Nikola Tesla and, and um, Edlitz Kalnan's comments and even Albert Einstein and many others about the electron and that whole agenda of creating, replacing the ether of, the, of creation with particle physics. Particle physics get very quickly replaces the ether because that's something they didn't want to get us sucked into. And suddenly Rutherford comes with his atomic model in 1909, 1911, and we are still stuck with the same bloody bullshit atomic model that was presented by Rutherford. And that, quite frankly, if you go and look at that experiment, that, that atomic model experiment, I'm sorry, I read it, I've looked at that over and over again. It is so naive, it is so stupid. And it, it can be so quickly and easily explained with magnetic fields. Everything that Rutherford experienced and reported on with his, uh, Ruther with his uh, experiment could be very simply explained with magnetic fields and toroidal fields. And then by the time Einstein's, Einstein released his theory of relativity, that was the final death knell in the ether, or the theory of the ether, or as we call resonance and frequency. What's even more interesting and important is that the many um, experiments that have been done, been done with the cosmic background radiation over the years have brought back some very, very interesting results. And uh, Max Tegmark from MIT, uh, in The Principle, I don't know if you've seen the documentary called The Principle, very clearly tells us, and he's the guy that drove that experiment, they found that from our perspective, the Earth is the center of all of creation. <laughs> this, is not, this is not popular in, in mainstream science. And yet this is, this is what the most mainstream science results, the results are telling us. That from our perspective, the Earth is the center of the universe. Not only that, that all, all the other observable uh, galaxies and solar systems seem to exist in layers moving away from Earth as the center of the universe. Do with this information what you want. What I'm going to bring you back to is that everything is connected through a fractal nature of resonance that creates magnetic fields and toroidal fractals throughout all of creation. The atomic models, the quantum theory, all of that stuff can be very easily explained with the stuff that I shared with you with sound resonance and magneticism. What happens is that the more questions we ask about this, the more mysterious are the things we find. And this is why I call this presentation exploring the nature of our reality and really pushing the boundaries of our, boundaries of our own capacity to tolerate new information. Because this certainly has shaken my reality and I no longer believe anything I'm told by any university professor anywhere because they're all lying. And yet, Max Tegmark gave us some very interesting information. What we do with it is what matters most. What do we do with all this knowledge? Because we can't affect what happened in the past, but we certainly can affect tomorrow morning when we wake up and we enter the world and we share our knowledge and information with others. And this is why I believe that we are the ones we've been waiting for and we are creating, we are co-creating a new reality. Now that you know how powerful your thoughts are, how powerful every word you write, how every powerful every message you leave for somebody on your cell phone, how every email you send, how powerful all your communication and all your thoughts are, you realize how quickly we can co-create a new reality for ourselves. Because all of this positive stuff, the positive thinking, the positive talking, the positive co-creation of a new reality for humanity that is filled with prosperity and abundance is right here. We are creating it as we speak it and as we think it. No one can stop that. It's up to us. And the more people say it, think it, speak it, imagine it, the quicker we are going to create it. And <clears throat> we are more enslaved now than we've ever been before, but with this enslavement comes the absolute 
understanding how, of how important it is to liberate, liberate ourselves from this enslavement. And it will require a whole new kind of thinking because we cannot, we cannot solve the problems that were created for us with the same kind of thinking that created the problems. So, our system is broken, it cannot be fixed. We all need a whole new kind of system to get out of this mess. We've been born into the slavery, we now understand it, we've grappled with it, it's okay. The fact that we get it, we understand it, we can now do something about it. And remember that it is the money system that has controlled us, that has enslaved us. Money is the tool by which we are enslaved. Until we come to terms with what money is, where it comes from, how it was created, we will remain subject of those who control and create the supply of money. And if you don't know this yet, the Sumerian king's tablets tell us very clearly that money was created as a tool of enslavement at a very specific point in time in history. It's when these first priest kings were descended from heaven to earth, and these first priest kings created the form of writing. They wrote their clay tablets, and they issued their clay tablets from their temples as the first bankers, as the firm first forms of money. These are the first forms of money we find on earth. Whether it's 6,000 or 8,000 years ago, who knows. But what it tells us is that the first kings owned all the land. They were the first bankers and their temples were their first banks. And the way they created money is exactly the same way that our bankers create money today. It was maliciously introduced as a tool of enslavement. Money is not a consequence of thousands of years of bartering and trading that eventually became this noble tool to help humanity today. Money is not there to help us. It's there to keep us enslaved and turn us into dead slaves forever. Now that we know this, and I hope you know this by now, we know what to do. And this is where the Ubuntu movement comes in. Creating prosperity and abundance, taking all this knowledge and information from the past and creating a beautiful platform upon which to build a prosperous and an abundant future for all of us. Not for some of us, for every single one of us. And if you don't know, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's for you. I'm sick of saying this. <laughs> no, it's not true. I'm not sick of saying it, but I'm getting tired of hearing my own voice saying it. Because now, you know, it needs, it's, it, it's got to be everyone else saying it. So, after 12 years of sharing the simple philosophy of Ubuntu and contributionism, it is now quarter to ten. You have a four minute video to watch. I'm going to leave you on a really positive note. And I can tell you right now that, and it's thanks to Chuck who put this lovely video together right here from Sedona. Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> and, um, and I can tell you right now that already we have mayors in Canada, in the USA, in Brazil, and even in South Africa. We have mayors that have come forward and said, I love this philosophy, I want to turn my town into the first small town that implements this, this philosophy. And once you know that by the time the first town goes this route, it's going to be an unstoppable wave of creation that'll, that'll spread around the world and no one's going to be able to stop it. No army, no government, no one will be able to stop this because it'll come from the people, millions of people in thousands of towns. So our one small town strategy is a combination of 12 years of research, work, figuring out how we're going to get out of this mess. And this is the new spearhead and the plan of action, the simple plan of action to get out of this slave this economic slavery we find ourselves in. So thanks very much for being here. Thanks for coming. Um, I, I hope that this has taken you to new areas of thought, of thinking about who you are and what your role is in this world and this nature of reality around us, which is not what we thought it was. And we now know what we're going to do tomorrow and live a beautiful life. Hello, I'm Michael Tillinger and I'm the founder of the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. Welcome to the launch of our new strategy and plan of action which we call One Small Town Can Change the World. So what is our plan? First we find a small town of around 5,000 people who want to participate in their own makeover, their own salvation, their own rescue mission. 
Then we find consensus between the people, the mayor, and the council. We identify the special skills and talents of the people. We identify the industrial and environmental potential of the town. Then we develop a razor-sharp business plan for a variety of community projects to match these skills and individual potential. These projects are actually meticulously well-planned businesses, but there is one huge difference between these and other businesses. These belong to all the people of the town, together with the investors that made it possible. Everyone in our town who participates in the transformation will contribute three hours per week towards one of these new projects. This creates a powerful free labor force that no other corporation can compete with. Then comes a really critical part of our plan. We analyze how much our town needs to consume of everything we produce. And then we produce at least three times as much as we need. We can do this with ease because our cooperative labor force. Everything we produce is distributed freely to everyone who participates. And the other two thirds are sold on the open market to our neighboring towns and cities or even exported if need be. But herein lies the twist. We sell whatever we produce cheaper than any other supplier. How is this possible? Because of our free labor force and the ingredients that we supply ourselves. And so in a strange twist of fate, money will become the tool that destroys capitalism. It becomes clear that contributionism devours capitalism wherever it may be. This will lead to a substantial income stream from all our projects very quickly. From food to technology, healthcare to music, tourism to engineering and so much more that would not be possible in a capitalist model. Why? Because it would simply not be financially viable. Set your imagination free and imagine how much wealth our little town will create from just 50 new projects. But what do we do with all this money? We keep it simple, as we always should. One third goes to the investors or the farmers or the factory owners that turn their businesses into a community project. One third goes to upgrading and maintaining and constantly creating new projects based on the needs and skills of the people. And the last third is distributed equally to everyone who participates in the projects. This provides for an elegant and simple transition phase. No one has to leave their job because everyone has three hours a week. And very soon, the people of our town will be receiving more money from community projects than their jobs while getting most of the things we need to live for free. As this abundance begins to grow and our town becomes wealthy beyond comprehension, new projects will start up every week giving expression to the creative talents of our people. One by one, the people who work for the mines and other dangerous industries will leave their jobs because they earn more money and benefits from contributing only three hours per week. And without any resistance, opposition or conflict, the nasty corporations will close because nobody will work there anymore. And the existing system will simply shut down and fade from our memory as we create a new system and a new social structure. At this point we realize that we don't need money at all. And yet we have more money now than we've ever had before. Everyone will know that money does nothing and people do everything. And so in a strange twist of fate, we use the tools that enslave us to free us from that slavery and build an unshakable foundation in which the tools of enslavement have no more effect. There has never been a simpler way to unite the people and create abundance and prosperity for everyone. And there has never been a more lucrative investment opportunity to conscious millionaires to participate in creating a true utopian future for everyone. So, which will be the first small town to start the domino effect? Just one small town that'll change the world. Why not yours? Okay, thanks very much, that was it. I'm glad to see you still awake. 
Um, I'm going to bring the stone out here if you want to touch it. You can, the sacred stone. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks very much for being here. I'm exhausted beyond words. Uh, I've been really sick. Both Emma and I have been very sick uh, for the last week. Really bad throat infection, body infection. We're both on antibiotics, so I'm amazed that I've actually been able to stand up here. Um, I do feel a little dizzy right now, but I appreciate you hanging in till the bitter end. Now go out there and share this news with everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks very much.